is the approach in the matter between the state and the ABC, the Fable, sorry, Damini. For the state. This is the court, please, my lord. I appear on behalf of the respondent. Right. As it pleases the court, my lord, together with my learned colleagues, Ms. Seboko yes. and Mr. Ngokai Tobi, we appear for the appellant in this matter. Okay. Did, my lord, <laughs> overnight, my lord, yes. Uh, the, a copy was, uh, if your lordship could just yeah, check. I, I, I yes. have the copy. Yes, I apologize for that, my lord. I will, I will take your lordship through, okay. through the heads on the, under, on the understanding that <laughs> you're seeing them for the first time. Okay. <coughs> As God yeah, please. you may proceed. As God My lord, um, in a nutshell, this is an appeal uh, in terms of uh, Section 65 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Uh, against the refusal to admit to bail the appellant okay. um, in the magistrate's court. Right. What happens here, my lord, is that we will take your lordship. We, in our heads, your lordship will notice that we've tried to reduce the issues to the essence. The bare essence are contained in paragraph two of our heads, my lord. Namely, that uh, it would seem that the, the refusal was based on section 60, bracket 4, bracket A, and E of the Criminal Procedure Act. Now, we will take your lordship to uh, a, a journey through some of the charges, some of the issues that were raised in the hearing, as well as... Uh, the basis upon which we will contend that the magistrate was clearly, but very clearly wrong mm -hmm. in the conclusion, and that he ought in the circumstances to have admitted the applicant to bail. Okay. In this particular case, we will go as far as to show that the state in its various guises is doing nothing less than simply to try and reintroduce detention without trial through the back door. This case, my lord, uh, has got some broader uh, social and uh, political connotations uh, because it happened in the context of a student protest at the University of the Witwatersrand mm -hmm. under the so-called uh, fees must fall uh, campaign, which is ongoing at our universities, at least since around about September. It would seem, my lord, with the greatest respect, that there has been a, 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 a uh, concerted effort to keep the appellant out of the campus and to ensure that he does not participate in the legitimate uh, struggle for free education that he talks about in his affidavit. But I will come to that uh, a little bit later. The issue here, my lord, is this. Ironically, the leading case in that deals with section 64 is the case of S versus Lamini, another Lamini. Um, and in that case, my lord, it is clearly, clearly set out that one of the offending uh, objections or, or, or the, the offending features of section 60 bracket 4, uh, in respect of which the constitutionality of those provisions was attacked in that case unsuccessfully, if I may add. Is that the Krikla case? That's the Krikla case, my lord. And uh, the full citation yeah. is, um, I know it's on page uh, 771. There, there you are. S versus Lamini, 1999, 7, BCLR, 771, CC. Okay. And if I may, my lord, uh, the, the 
<coughs> refrain, the refrain in this case is that what needs to be washed against is that some surreptitious creeping in of the abhorrent uh, preventative detention or so-called detention without trial uh, under the guise of a refusal to, to bail. In fact, at paragraph 51, I'll just go to the sections that deal with 4A and 4E, which are the relevant uh, okay. uh, sections. At paragraph 51, the Leonard uh, Justice Krichler says that the validity of these sections, he's talking about 4A, was challenged on the basis that they allow preventive detention, which is constitutionally impermissible. Um, and then later, when he deals with 4E, which is even more pert pertinent, if, if your logic would allow me, it's a longish passage. Uh, at 56, he says the, f the following. I do not wish to be understood as saying anything in favor of detention without trial. We are concerned here with the detention or release in anticipation of a proper trial. We are moreover and more importantly concerned with the possible detention following upon a proper and public hearing before a judicial officer. And it says that the, con the constitutional principle is clear. A court may and not must take the factors enum uh, enumerated in subsection 8A into account and, and must do so judicially. And, and in the ordinary appeal and review mechanisms can remedy any undue deference that may be afforded to public sentiment. In other words, what he's saying in that last pa passage is that should uh, a lower court stray in favor of what he calls uh, deference to public sentiment, then and the ordinary mechanisms of appeal and review would ensure that that is corrected, which is exactly where we are. That is why we are here. And then at paragraph 57, which is very important, he says, it is important to note that subsection 4E expressly postulates that it has come to play only in exceptional circumstances. This is a clear point that this unusual category of factors is to be taken into account only in those rare cases where it is really justified. If I may pause there. What the learned judge is saying, uh, my lord, is that sex, subsection 4A and 4E, which deal with so-called non-trial related factors for bail, should only be used in so-called rare, very rare cases. Um, is it exceptional cases or rare? Uh, uh, both. In, in, in fact, he is expanding on the, on the, on the uh, phrase exceptional okay. cases to say it, 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 it must also be in, in those rare cases where it is justified. What is more, subse subsection 4E also expressly stipulates that a finding of such exceptional circumstances has to be established on a preponderance of probabilities, a likelihood. Lastly, once the existence of such circumstances has been established, paragraph E must still be weighed against the considerations enumerated in subsection 9 before a decision to refuse bail can be taken. Having regard to these juris jurisdictional prerequisites, the field of application for subsection 4E and 8A will be extremely limited. F your Lordship could underline that part. The field of application for 4E will be extremely limited. Judicial officers will therefore rely on this ground with great circumspection in the knowledge that the Constitution protects the liberty interests of all. Incorrect application of the criteria listed in subsection 4 by elevating one of them unduly is a matter for the criminal justice system to remedy. It must do so by applying section 64.9 in the balanced manner prescribed and in according with the spirit and purport of the objects of the Bill of Rights. The limitation of the right is therefore as narrowly tailored as possible to achieve the compelling interest in maintaining public peace and meets the requirements uh, of proportionality between the purpose of this and the nature of the right. In a nutshell, what is being said here, my lord, is that these uh, sections that the learned magistrate relied on yeah. must 
only apply where there are ce ce exceptional circumstances which have been established in rare cases where there's a likelihood of the things that are postulated in the sections which I'll go into happening and that it, it must be done with great circumspection. And the reason is very clear, my Lord. It is because we are now in the constitutional era. The days of uh, solving political problems by uh, the expedient of so-called detention without tri trial and so-called uh, removal of the unwanted persons from society uh, that we know are gone. In the olden days, you had um, so-called Internal Security Act, the Terrorism Act, uh, your Lordship will remember, um, the uh, Suppression of Communism Act, and all those uh, methods which were meant to achieve one objective only. Once you are a, a politically uh, unwanted person, there must be a way to remove you from society in what is called <coughs> anticipatory punishment. In other words, before you receive a trial, you are going to be uh, punished and, and, and taken away. And, and, and if all of those mechanisms failed, uh, then uh, it was the good old detention without trial, either under the emergency regulations and so on. Those days, with the greatest respect, are gone. And that is why His Lordship, Mr. Justice Krichler, said the, the objections to 64A and 4E must take into account these dangers of uh, uh, what we call anticipatory punishment. And that is why the standard is set so high. And that standard, with the greatest respect, was set, was put at, at its best in uh, S versus Chabalala. Yeah, S versus Chabalala is uh, 1998, bracket two, um, SACR. page 259C, my lord. Mm. And uh, for ease of reference, it is quoted in uh, page 9-41 of, of the toy, of the commentary on the CPA. And there, his, learned, uh, his lordship, Mr. Comrie, said the following, concluded that there has to be a practical burden on the prosecution to adduce evidence, underline, or furnish information going to show that a likelihood as envisaged in section 64 existed. The prosecution has to do so convincingly. In other words, if you are going to come and say, uh, here in this case, there are circumstances that show that the release of the accused will Disturbed, disturb the so-called public peace mm. or cause uh, all the calamities that are envisaged, then you must show a likelihood. There's a burden on the state to show a likelihood of that happening, and they must do so convincingly. And that case was quoted uh, recently in the case of uh, Jacobus, versus Eldred, Jacobus Eldred versus the state uh, on the 22nd of August 2016 in the Eastern Cape. Uh, we, we are making arrangements. It's an unreported judgment, my lord. We've made arrangements with your lordship's uh, office okay. to, to make copies. So I'll just read this. It's a very sh a short passage. It's mm. on Who's paragraphs the, 9 and 10 of that judgment. Who is the judge there? It's uh, uh, Rugunanan, A-J, R-U-G-U-N-A-N-A-N, A-J, Malo. Okay. And the case number is 156 through 2016. The learned judge said, uh, uh, relying on, on, on the Chabalala case, at paragraph 9, 
As appears from subparagraphs B and C, it must be established that there was a likelihood that the appellants, if released, would evade their trial or attempt to influence or intimidate witnesses. The word likelihood connotes something more than a mere temptation. It is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as meaning a probability. In S versus Chabalala, uh, with the citation that I've given, the following was stated at 271E uh, to F, quote, Likelihood in this context simply means probability. In cases not governed by Section 6011, if bail is denied, the state would have to establish, is the quotation that I, I, I okay. read earlier. Paragraph 10, respectfully, the magistrate did not appreciate that in assessing the likelihood required by the aforementioned subsections, the requisite standard of proof could not be established on the strength of a mere opinion by uh, Warrant Officer Africa unless it, has, it was well grounded on proven facts. Accordingly, the magistrate misdirected himself, which renders his decision open to interference. Hence, the resultant order in the following paragraphs. Mm -hmm. That is as recent as uh, uh, about two months ago, the affirmation of the, of the, of the uh, Chabalala standard. Now, my lord, the, his lordship, Mr. Justice Krichla, in the, in the, in the um, uh, Lamin case, also says something, I'll find the, the, the passage now, about that it's not just me, mere speculation, nor is it a, a, a conjuncture. It must be uh, something that is well established with the with the uh, standards that we know. Now let's go to the, 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 the real question of what is it in this, in this particular case that is being suggested um, is the danger that, that requires the appellant to, to stay in, pr in prison. And, and I'll, I'll read out my lot, uh, section 60 bracket four. Okay. It says, the interests of justice do not permit the release from detention of an accused where one or more of the following grounds are established. Again, underline the word established. For A, which is the first uh, pillar that my learned colleague will rely on, where there is a likelihood that the accused, if, she, if he or she were released on bail, will endanger the safety of the public or any particular person, or will commit a Schedule One offense. Now, with the greatest respect, my lord, there is not even a whiff of evidence uh, or uh, proposal uh, th that can be supported by facts here that there is a likelihood that if the accused is released, he will endanger the safety of the public. Mm. Not even mention any particular person. There's no such person or the commission of a Schedule 1 offense. Mm. So we, we, I'm going to assume that my learned colleague is going to confine himself to the question of endangering the safety of the public, because the others are just uh, uh, not applicable at all. Now, two key words. The grounds must be established, and there must be a likelihood, as it was de defined. Now, where would you get that likelihood, my lord, in this case? You would get it uh, from either evidence of what has actually happened, uh, where you can then postulate, your lordship would then have to postulate what is likely to happen based on what has happened. In other words, some kind of extrapolation uh, from past conduct. But the emphasis of this uh, is futuristic. In other words, there must be a likelihood that one, one, if he is released, he will do X. Y and Z. And then 4E is even more stringent. That's the one that, 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 that uh, uh, Krichla, Krichla said it must be used only in rare circumstances. Says it must be established that in exceptional circumstances, there is a likelihood that the release of the accused will disturb the public order or undermine the public peace or security. Now, 
let's just quickly uh, go to the facts of this case, my love. You have a situation where, in a clear attempt to, as I say, to remove the, the appellant from uh, the, the university. Firstly, spurious charges are put against him. And I will, I will go to the, to the charges at a later stage. But once those charges have been put, then at the bail stage, knowing that uh, uh, some of the charges will have to be proved in a trial, and that's the, the danger of the so-called punitive uh, detention without trial. Because you can charge a person with anything, knowing full well that the trial will never happen or he will succeed in the trial. It doesn't matter. As long as we just remove him for now, uh, if he wins the case in two years' time, well, that, 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 uh, uh, so be it. And so what you get, my lord, with the greatest respect, is I'll just give you one example to, to illustrate that these charges don't hold any water what, whatsoever. At page 13 of bundle one, must apologize again, my lord. We, we know we should have done a continuous bundle, but, but there are two. Page 13, my lord, yes. On top of it, it will say an extra A. The record, my lord, is in two bundles. Yeah, okay. yeah bundle. Is this the one that incorporates the judgment? That's correct, my lord. Page, on paginated page 13. Yeah. Yes. Now, you know, big promise, public violence, this is the, the charge. Now, if you look at the charge, my lord, it's, it's, it's actually pathetic. It says that on or about the 4th of October, at or near the University of the Vedvatas Ran, the regional division of uh, Gauteng, they accused, and d diverse other persons numbering in excess of 20, did unlawfully assemble with the common intent to forcibly disturb the public peace or security or invade the rights of other persons. And the said accused acting in concert. This is what now the, 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 the highlight, what they did. They did then unlawfully and intentionally disrupt the academic activities of the University of the Vedvatasran. That's all. Where's the violence? All that is being said here is that uh, a group of students of more than 20 disrupted act academic activities. Now, it shows you the true motive. It's got nothing to do with violence. It is to put a charge which is political in nature, which says, well, if you're going to disturb other students that are, that are studying, then we're going to uh, deal with you. Um, all the charges are like that. I don't want to, to, to waste the court's time. But they can be criticized in that, in that same manner. So let's then come to what it is that is alleged, that the, the applicant is alleged to have, done, to have done. Firstly, there's the issue of the so-called propensity. It is said that he has a propensity, A, to disobey court orders, and B, to act violently. Let's try and look at both of those uh, uh, propositions. The first one is quite laughable. It is based on a, a court order, which is on page 27, my lord. Of, of bundle A. Your Lordship got it, yes. Your Lordship will notice very immediately that uh, this court order is dated 25 April 2016. The appellant is not anywhere cited in that court order. The appellant says that he was not aware of this court order. 
But in any event, my Lord, there is nothing whatsoever that links this, whatever it is that was being interdicted on the 25th of April 2016 to the current uh, Fees Must Fall campaign, which, as we know, was sparked in September, only in September, by the announcement of the Minister of Education of an 8% increase. So you just get thrown with a piece of paper that has no relevance whatsoever to the current proceedings. We don't know what it is. Who are these people who are cited here? And it. I don't know, my lord. They, they may or they may not be. They may be workers. No, nobody knows. That's exactly the point. The point is that, and, and the tenuous basis upon which uh, uh, our learned colleague wanted to include uh, Mr. Zamini was under the seventh respondent participants in protest action engaged in unlawful activities. What? This might have been a boycott about food or working conditions or whatever. On what basis can you then say in, September, in, in another protest that is sparked, its common cause is sparked by activities in September, October, and then you say a person who's not a, even a party to this thing is, a, 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 is, is violating, quote unquote, uh, uh, the, same future. exactly, violate prospectively, as it were. But you also violate something you don't even know. Uh, exist, or at least uh, in respect of which there's no proof that you uh, existence that uh, you you are aware of, and so on and so on. So again, my lord, it's one of the all these charges are, have got great promise. Oh, you violated the court order, and therefore you have a propensity. But you can't have a propensity when we can't even prove that you ever violated a court order even once. The propensity must at least have a basis of something that has happened uh, in real life which is likely to be repeated. That's what, well, that's what we call propensity. So if you fail on base one, you can't even prove that you actually ever violated, then how, how much more about uh, the future? So it's all uh, trumped up charges, uh, which uh, uh, even just at scratching the surface, you find that uh, this is just nothing else but uh, a political uh, pers persecution. Is That's correct, Pala. Uh, 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 in, in the university. In the university. Yes, the, 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 that is so, my lord. I mean, there's no cross, uh, order, rather, which stipulates this. You know, like, there is, my lord. There is paragraph there is. four. Paragraph four, yes. Mm. Paragraph 4.2. 4.2. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but uh, your lordship is correct. The point is. Let us assume it, it, firstly, we don't know if it was done, okay. but let us assume in, in, in favor of, of the university that it was done, my lord. So what? Let's say it was done. Let's even assume that it was put in, in, at prominent places. The question is, what has that got to do with the current protests? Yeah. How do you say you don't release this man uh, from detention because some other people who were protesting in April, maybe at medical school or wherever. We don't know. The point of the matter is that we don't know. Maybe they were protesting about sporting facilities, and then they, 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 they caused. There is no linkage, the point of the matter, my lord. There's no linkage between this. Uh, and also, it doesn't uh, say when, when it expires. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's open-ended. Yeah, the, and, and my lord, for, uh, the, for the purposes of this argument, it is simply to say that here's another spurious uh, basis upon which the so-called propensity uh, is, is based. Um, now, the, 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 the second um, reason why your lordship should deprive uh, 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 the appellant of his uh, constitutional rights to liberty and his rights to education and, uh, all, and these rights to uh, political participation and all that goes with it is that 
it is said that he, he, there's a, a chance that he will disturb the peace by causing violence. So let's inspect that one. What, now that we've uh, taken away the question of the so-called court orders. That, my Lord, is based on, I don't even want to call it evidence. What the, my learned colleague did was to produce, firstly, he promised that he would produce a video evidence at the, at the magistrate's court hearing. Not only did he promise that, but so did the, the policemen who, who, who produced the only evidence, the only affidavit. Fellowship goes to page 22. Yes, that's um, uh, uh, Rafapa, yeah. Sergeant Rafapa. He says that on, on Tuesday the 4th, the accused was part of a group of protesting students at the University of Bedford's Rand. I'm reading a paragraph 7, sorry, Malone. There were numerous police officials and other persons present on the campus who were filming the protest. There is footage on the accused in possession of various dangerous weapons in the form of rocks and sticks. The possession of these uh, dangerous weapons continues whilst the accused addresses the protesting students on the university grounds. The video footage feature shows that the accused throwing a brick at a moving police vehicle and so on. Now, the, your logic will see that there's promise in this affidavit of video footage of all these things. This is actually what happened at the, at the hearing. This promise of the video footage was never uh, actualized. All that was produced were two still photographed photographs. Um, I was looking for the, at thirty-seven. Actually, it starts, it starts um, at 35, my lord. I'm sorry, my lord. If you can start, just start at the bottom of 34. The prosecutor says, uh, my learned colleague says, Your Worship, the first thing that I wish to submit, the affidavit of the investigating officer indicates that there is indeed video footage. That's what we've just gone through. Of that video footage, we are in possession of still photographs that have been taken of that video footage. And then it goes on. Um, and then it says, the first one, uh, that's around about line six, the first one being of what clearly can be seen in the video, but it is shown in here, a person from behind the that the state alleges is Mr. Zamin throwing what appears to be a rock at a police vehicle. And the learned magistrate says, my lord, sorry, let me just mark this document. Why? Why does the state claim that the person on this photograph will the applicant is the applicant before the court because it is a photograph of the rear of this person. In other words, all they brought was a photograph of somebody from the back. And then uh, the prosecutor then says, Your Worship, in the video footage that there is of the day, and I wish to inform the court, I've, I have myself viewed the video footage, he says. Uh, I'm not speaking of what is said by the police officers, blah, blah, blah. And it's obviously not, my lord, <laughs> with the greatest respect. You, you, you can't be testifying uh, unless, of course, he was subsequently going to produce that, that, that evidence. I can assure you, my lord, it's common cause that that never happened. And then the, the learned magistrate correctly says this. 
at the bottom of the page. Okay, so to summarize, the state is in possession of some real evidence of which this is a, this is a still photograph, and from the real evidence, namely the video recording, it will emerge that this person on this photograph is indeed the applicant before the court. My learned colleague says, indeed so, your worship. Needless to say, that promise was a hollow promise because the, it, the, it did not emerge ever because the uh, video evidence was never uh, produced. And then again, at the bottom of page 36, the court says, this is now another still photograph of somebody allegedly throwing a brick. The court says, again, as far as this photograph is concerned, which is marked Exhibit C2, the person on the photograph is wearing a helmet, which is not possible uh, to say, and neither is the court prepared to become a witness during these proceedings to identify the applicant before the court as the same person on this photograph. But to summarize then, if I understand you correctly, this photograph is a still photograph of the real evidence, a video recording that will show, that will show that this person is indeed the accused before the court. The, my learned friend, indeed so, your worship. So what do we have, my lord? We have you, the, the learned judge or, or this court or even the learned magistrate is expected <laughs> to distill a likelihood that has been established that this accused person will in the future uh, uh, act violently. Why? Because he has done so in the past. But what do we have? The back of a person. And, uh, and, and what we have? Some unidentifiable uh, uh, person as the magistrate says, I'm not even prepared to be a, a witness in this case. And that person is even wearing a, a helmet. So that is all. How on earth is your lordship supposed to then extrapolate that this person is so dangerous, this person being now the, the appellant, is so dangerous that they must be kept in custody until uh, the trial, which may happen in a year or two, simply based on such a nonsensical uh, 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 presentation of, of, of evidence. The likelihood must be established. It must be established convincingly. This is convincingly cannot be used in the same sentence as what I've taken uh, your, lord, your lordship through. And with the greatest respect, that is all, my lord, uh, that you have on the basis on, of which uh, somebody's liberty is supposed to be, um, to be challenged. And I'm going to, uh, I, I challenge my, my, my learned colleague uh, to take this court through the basis upon which, A, it can be said that this accused person has a propensity to uh, disobey court orders on the basis of what I've ex explained, and B, that firstly, that it was him on those photographed on those photographs and even if it was him whether what they say uh, was happening was actually happening because in the other one they claim to have a person and a brick which is flying in the air where it came from we don't know and uh, the 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 if maybe if they had presented the video but it's too late now uh, because this is an appeal so th that's what we have, my lord. Uh, that, that's all you have before you, on the basis of which your lordship, <laughs> your lordship is supposed to conclude that sections 64A and 44E, which must be used sparingly in rare cases and uh, in, in, in very exceptional circumstances, uh, actually apply in this particular case. With the greatest respect, my lord, there is nothing of the sort uh, that will be presented to you by my learned colleague. That I can guarantee. Yeah. Uh, now, the, 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 the next question, my lord, is um, and I, for this, my lord, if I can take your lordship to page 32.
the core of, of, of what we are going to uh, present here is based on paragraphs 23 and 24. And I've just dealt with paragraph 23. I'll read them out. This is, what, this is the affidavit that was presented by, by um, the appellant. These charges, I quote, although seemingly serious at face value, have no factual foundation, and I am confident that they will never be proved in any fair court process. I've already done, that dealt with that. And he says, it is my honest view that these charges are politically motivated and a means to remove me, where it says from should be end, my lord, to, to remove me and others from leading the legitimate national call for free, quality, decolonized education. That is all. Now, my learned, colleagues, uh, my learned colleague is going to say that in respect of the second leg of that argument, where the appellant says that the charges are politically motivated and uh, just a means to remove, to remove him, we, we are seeking to introduce a new, a new fact. Well, nothing could be further from the truth, and I'll explain, my lord. Firstly, I've just read it, so it's not new. It was before the magistrate. All we have done, my lord, is to, is to expand in the notice of uh, appeal is to expand on that proposition. And uh, this is quite a, a serious matter, my lord, that I'm going to raise now. If your lordship goes to page eight, starting from paragraph 17. The notice says that the learned magistrate failed to, to take into account the uncontradicted evidence of the accused when he stated at paragraph 24 of his affidavit, which was submitted to court, that, and then it's the uh, allegation of political motive. And he, say, he says at 18, even the slightest possibility of any truth in that statement would signal the grossest abuse of the rights of the accused and offend against the most basic values and freedoms enshrined in the Constitution. It would be reminiscent of the days of our shameful apartheid past from which the Constitution was intended to mark a significant departure. In this regard, the above honorable court will be entitled to take into account the now notorious fact that the Minister of Justice has publicly confirmed that on the 10th of October 2016, and only a few days prior to the arrest and prosecution of the accused, the National Director of Public Prosecutions, Advocate Sean Abrams, met with the Minister and the President of the Republic of South Africa at Lutuli House in Johannesburg, which is the headquarters of the African National Congress, the ruling political party, to discuss the situation around the fees must fall protest. It, uh, uh, my, my Lord, I'm sure it's common cause, but I would say it, it's a notorious. The, the reason why we use the word notorious, my Lord, is because we, it's something that the court could take uh, judicial notice of. But I'll check with my learned friend if it's contested. Okay. Yes. My Lord, yes, no, it is common cause that it happened, but the, of course, my learned colleague will, will argue, as I said earlier, that it should not be taken into account. Well, he'll tell us, he'll tell us, uh, we'll, uh, if, if it happened, if he agrees that it happened. Well, he can't, because the Minister of Justice said it happened. And then, at paragraph 20, we say, my Lord, this meeting constitutes the best evidence of the feared political interference and political motives behind the prosecution of the accused. In other words, this is not just a, a wild statement that is being made, my lord. It is being linked with what was in front of the magistrate, which, with what the, the 
accused said in uh, paragraph 24 of his affidavit. And then we said 21, which is where the gist is. It is difficult to conceive of any legitimate and lawful meeting between the Minister of Justice, the President, and the National Director of Public Prosecutions in respect of student protests. And apparently in the absence of the Ministers of Education and Finance or even the Commissioner of Police, the only reasonable conclusion is that the affected politicians sought unduly and improperly to influence the prosecution of student leaders, as has happened with the accused, who remains one of the most prominent leaders of the Fees Must Fall movement. So, 22, such interference is unconstitutional and if subsequently established, as we have now established it, it will almost certainly result in the quashing of any charges tainted thereby. And if I may add, it might also result, as we read now, in the debarment of the NDPP. The accused has instructed his legal representatives to pursue this matter insofar as his personal liberty has been severely violated in the process. My Lord, the, the, this is not a playing matter. If this, if this actually happened, what do we have here, my Lord? We have a situation, and I don't have to lecture your Lordship about the importance of the independence of prosecutions. The courts cannot be used to play political games. Uh, if a, any prosecutor with the assault would know, firstly, my Lord, that if there's any uh, break, uh, 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 unlawful activity at any university, then the people who must deal with that is the police. And the police, only after the police have dealt with it, should it then be escalated to the public prosecution. What on earth can a public prosecutor be discussing with the president and the Minister of Justice about uh, protest action. Assume that protest action is all unlawful and bad and, and all that. But it is not the duty of a, 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 a public prosecutor to go and discuss that, not to mention at the headquarters of a political party. So this is but proof of what the, the fear which was expressed by the, by the uh, accused person. And all these uh, point to one direction and one direction only. This is a, a, a very well calculated means to suppress political opponents by using the same old tactics like before of uh, detaining them without giving them a chance uh, to be heard in court and by painting them with um, silly charges such as the one that we have just gone through. Now, the, the, the only relevance at this stage, my Lord, of this is not whether the charges might be quashed or not. It is simply that your Lordship has to be mindful of the red flags that were, that were uh, identified in the Tlamini case by the Constitutional Court, that these uh, provisions, in so far, in fact, my Lord, your Lordship will know that his Lordship, Mr. Justice Krichler, actually said that these provisions invade the rights of, of, of accused persons. But he then said, in, in terms of Section 36, they can be justified. So the fact that these are very intrusive uh, 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 provisions is beyond any question. It was just in that particular case, in, in view of the question of the constitutional challenge, found that uh, the, the, they, they can, in a particular case, be, uh, be justified. Um, oh, yes, that's a good and, and a natural place to pause, my lord. <laughs> that's a good place. Thank you.
Yes, this is the last That's 53. Yeah. Yeah. That's 51 I read. That's the first one. Yeah, that's 53. This
Oh, that you know that the same guy is saying, I want to say some, something happened to him overnight. that is extremely limited with laser. Its field of application is limited. I, I, you think it's full bench? I think it's, I think it's the, the arm. If you, 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 if you,
Yeah, but was not uh, I show it in the thing. Yeah, I think this is. But just click on the link. It will open. Yeah, yeah. yeah click twice on the link. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So they discuss here the impartiality of the NPA right? And if you look at 55, when the meeting is in the former 
Is it, it must be reported. Don't check the Yeah, I actually have coaches, that's why I said I didn't want to. I found here. Yeah. No, this is. What? I'm, I keep on taking. Everyone has got to join in this, in this talk. <laughs> There's a. Um, Separation between the people who do this crime and those who decide to prosecute that is an important one. And I think this is David is focused on the politicians. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, but the, the, it, it's part about it's the ethics. Members of the prosecuting look at this one. Members of the prosecuting authority are certain personal in good faith. They should not allow their judgment to be influenced by factors such as their personal views of the nature of the place, ethnic, national, or the sex, political views. Oh, you got the copy, sir. But now it's so difficult. We would have asked for this one, but it's a little long. I think it would be nice if we have time. If we don't, we don't. Yeah, let's try. It would be nice to give it to you. Order. Oh, you want to see the school? Yeah, oh, okay. Okay. I don't think um, the current map is. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it seems so. Um, shortly, I don't see Mr. Comey has arrived yet, but I will let him know. Okay, that fine. Yeah, yeah that okay. Okay. Or is he on bail tomorrow night at 9 o'clock? This is case number 46.
of 2010, Pietro Oduman and others. The matter is rolled over to tomorrow due to it being crowded out. You remain on bail, okay? Get a seat, sir. Yes, Mr. Oh. As God pleases, my lord. My lord, if I may, mm. uh, just start by quoting to your lordship a very useful passage, uh, which you, your lordship will find at. Uh, 9-32a of uh, Dutoy's commentary on criminal procedure. Okay. It is the, a, a case where w w the, the, the learned authors deal with um, what the question of exceptional circumstances are. Mm. <clears throat> and it starts by quoting a case of S versus Skittercut. S versus Skittercut is SCH I E T E K A T nineteen ninety nine one S A C R one hundred C a judgment of uh, acting judge Slomovitz. Yeah. He says, my lord, I I'll paraphrase the first part. He basically says that look, it's the duty of the courts to protect the community mm -hmm. and so on, as we all know. Uh, is a consideration in these bail uh, issues. And then he says, which is very, very uh, poignant in these kinds of circumstances, despite this, in other words, despite the duty of the court to protect uh, society, courts have a greater obligation to society at large. <clears throat> they must jealously guard the rule of law. That is the lesson of this century. A court of law must not permit the body politic to give legislative credibility for whatever reason to uninformed or ignorant public outcry <clears throat> or to what the government <clears throat> of the day perceives will, be, will best assuage those feelings of the general public which, if quelled, are calculated to do no more than to ensure that it be returned to elected office, whether it deserves to be or not. <clears throat> now, what, is Leonard, uh, what, what the Leonard Church is saying, my Lord, there, is that despite the obvious duties to protect society, a court must be very circumspect that it is not uh, being used as a tool uh, for in some uh, elaborate political game. And I would like my lot to refer to what the learned author Cowling says about uh, the same subject. Uh, if a lordship will just bear with me, yes. This is this you will find a lordship at nine twenty three. And again, it's uh, in the context of the discussion of section sixty, bracket four. And it's very interesting that section sixty bracket four is always uh, uh, discussed in this cautionary mode of saying it should never be allowed to be used for political purposes. Cowling, in writing in uh, 1996, SACJ, uh, page 50, at 56, quoted here, submits that subsection 60, bracket 4, bracket A, must be narrowly interpreted, lest it would take on the, contra the connotations of the, quote, interests of state security, unquote, which was the foundation for security legislation of the former regime. The same warnings that have uh, been warned 
uh, uh, that have been sounded here. But my Lord, subject to what my learned colleague is going to say about uh, our, our submission, that this is nothing but a political smokescreen, let me preempt him by reading for your Lordship uh, what hopefully he will read to his bosses uh, about uh, what to do and what not to do if you are a prosecutor. My Lord, the case I'm going to cite is S versus Yengeni, 2006-1, SACR 405T, a, ju a judgment of uh, their lordships, Mr. Justice Prella and Bertelsmann. And I hope that uh, all the people who implicated in this uh, uh, behavior that we spoke about earlier will be listening. At paragraph 52, the Leonard, uh, the, the Leonard judges say the following. The untrammeled exercise of their powers in a spirit of professional independence is vital to the functioning of the legal system. The independence of the judiciary is directly related to and depends upon the independence of the legal professions and of the national director of public prosecutions. Undermining this freedom from outside influence would lead to the entire legal process, including the functioning of the judiciary, being held hostage to those interests that might be threatened by a fearless, committed, and independent search for the truth. Section 22.4 of the Act obliges the National Dir Director of Public Prosecutions to bring the provisions of the United Nations guidelines on the role of public pro prosecutors to the attention of every prosecutor and director of the authority and to promote respect for and compliance with these principles. And I'll jump to paragraphs 55. And this was now in the specific, if I may preface this, my Lord, here, there was a, the criticism that the court was giving was the meet, a meeting between the then National Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr. Nguga, and the minister regarding a politically sensitive case of uh, Mr. Yengen. And the learned charge says, when the meeting between the appellant, Mr. Nguga, and the former minister is viewed in the light of these principles and guidelines, it is clear that it was unwise for all three participants to engage in it. It was unwise for the appellant to seek the aid of the minister because the mere fact of doing so might create the impression that he was seeking the support of a politically powerful ally to influence the exercise of the national director's discretion in his favor on grounds that had more to do with political connectivity than with the merits of the case. By the same token, it was unwise for the minister to participate in these discussions at all, precisely because it might create the perception that he was exercising improper political pressure on the national director in taking a decision that was in his exclusive discretion, or perhaps more properly in that of the prosecutor concerned. And lastly, it was indubitably ill-advised of the former national director of public prosecutions to be seen to participate in a discussion with the minister and the appellant. The independence of the office that, held and the, that he held and the fearless and unfettered exercise of the extensive powers that this office confers are incompatible with any hint or suggestion that he might have lent an ear to politicians who might wish to advance the best in interest of a crony rather than the search for the truth and the proper functioning of the criminal and penal processes. <clears throat> so we have exactly the same situation, my Lord, here. Almost prophetically uh, postulated by the appellant, Mr. Dlamini, that what is happening here is a situation that um, is clearly meant to take him 
uh, out of society permanently, as the apartheid apparatchiks used to say. And what is important, my lord, is the fact that this, the, the, the version, this is the version of the public, national public prosecutor, which he repeated in parliament, and the version of the minister, that this meeting was about the, the situation in the universities. And hardly four or five days thereafter, the leaders of the Fees Must Fall movement are rounded up, and Mr. Gabot Lamini is uh, uh, detained, where he's still sitting in a cell uh, as we speak. Now, moving on, my lord, to the, to the issue of, of, of um, the, the, the standard. There is a passage which I would like to bring to the attention of your lordship in the Jamini case, paragraph 53, which emphasizes the standard that my learned friend is going to, the hurdle that he is going to have to jump uh, to convince your lordship that uh, the factors are present. It is contained, my lord, in paragraph 53 of S versus Lamini. And it deals with the, the, the issue that I raised of the distinction between the so-called trial factors and non-trial mm -hmm. factors. Right. He, uh, his Lordship, Mr. Jessica Klichler says, the, bro the broad policy considerations contemplated in the, quote, interest of justice test in that context can legitimately include <laughs> the risk that the detainee will endanger a particular individual or the public at large. Less obviously, but nonetheless constitutionally, constitutionally acceptably, a risk that the detainee will commit a fairly serious offense can be taken into account. The important proviso throughout is that there has to be a likelihood, that is a probability that such risk will materialize. A possibility or suspicion will not suffice. At the same time, a finding that there is indeed such a likelihood is no more than a factor to be weighed with all others in deciding what the interests of justice are. That is not constitutionally offensive, nor does it resemble detention without trial, the reprehensible institution really targeted when one speaks of preventive detention. Absent a proper basis for the original test, it will be set aside. But if there was a proper cause, one cannot justify release solely on the absence of trial-related grounds. So, my lord, that speaks for itself. That a mere possibility, you can't simply say, oh, well, uh, somebody who looks like you was spotted throwing a rock, and therefore uh, you must uh, rot in jail. You need to have something concrete, something specific, and something uh, that has been uh, proven. The next uh, uh, proposition, my lord, that <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll jump that point, my lord, and go to the next one. If I can take your lordship to page um, 47A, more specifically to 47C, the lordship will see that those are the additional reasons given by the magistrate for, for his decision. Mm. Well, he makes a... a um, a point about constitutional limitations, which I, I will, I'll, if it's raised, I will only I'll leave it to one of my uh, learned juniors to to discuss. I, I can't. Uh, and then, my lord, at page forty-seven C. This is important for your lordship to flag uh, the last, the, the second last paragraph. The applicant was not regarded as a flight risk by the court as submitted in the notice of appeal. 
Now, that's very significant, my lord, in the context of the distinctions that, that we have been making. Remember, if the magistrate regarded the, the appellant as a flight risk, then we would be in the area of so-called trial-related um, uh, 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 harm or, or, or dangers or fears. Yeah. So he, in, in his own words, rules out any trial-related uh, questions of, of him being a flight risk. So we're merely dealing here with uh, these so-called suspicions of what might happen in the future, which, uh, with the greatest respect, we have demonstrated, um, hopefully, were completely baseless. Um, then, my lord, your lordship, ultimately, in terms of uh, section uh, 60... Five, 5.4, the test at this stage, which is uh, at the appeal stage, is mm. whether the magistrate was wrong or not. Clearly wrong. Clear, clearly wrong, my lord. And it is, it is, it is uh, stated uh, in um, section 65.4 very succinctly as follows. The court or judge hearing the appeal shall not set aside the decision against which the appeal is brought unless such court or judge is satisfied that the decision was wrong, in which event the court or judge shall give the decision which in its or his opinion the lower court should have given. So that's what we're here about. And with the greatest respect, my lord, uh, it's, I can't even count the ways in which the magistrate was clearly wrong uh, that we have already dealt with. But just in case that's not enough, let's just look at one or two uh, before I round up, my lord, my lord. If your lordship goes to, and these are misdi patent misdirections with the greatest respects, which I will just use as illustrations. If your lordship goes to page 81 of uh, bundle B, This is where the magistrate, quite frankly, just mixes up everything. Um, the second paragraph, is your lordship there? Yes, I'm there. Yes. The so, where it says, the applicant referred to himself as one of the co-leaders of the said movement. It also emerged from the affidavit of the applicant that their demands addressed to the other role players, for instance, like the university, were frustrated and not met. And then he says, the result thereof was that the campaign became violent to such an extent that the university had to approach the court for a court order as referred to earlier. There he goes again, my, my lord, with, uh, I don't even want to call it circuitous uh, reasoning. So what he's suggesting is that in September, uh, they became so violent that in April, the the, the, the court, the, the university went to, to get a court order. I and mean, what is that? And then, convoluted, uh, uh, completely convoluted, my lord. It's, it's, it's more than wrong. It's just uh, blatantly uh, uh, out of, of, of place. Mm. Then the, the next one, the same magistrate who you'll remember, my lord, was saying, but how do I know it's him and so on and so on. Something happened to him overnight because he gave the judgment the following day. Suddenly, he says at the second last uh, paragraph, the two photographs of the, of the applicant, all of a sudden now, the two photographs of the applicant, namely exhibit C1 and C2, are damning evidence against the applicant. It depicts the applicant in possession of an object resembling a rock stone aimed in the direction of a police vehicle. Since when? This is the same person who was secondly saying, I can't see, this is the back of a person. Uh, how do I know it's him? Are you going to bring the videos? <laughs> Overnight, some, uh, it, it came, the light, the, it, the light came to him. And then again, he says, it is unlikely that the university would have approached the court for relief if there was no violent protest. We've already dealt with that. That's another convoluted uh, reasoning. Um, with no violent causing damage to their pro property and affecting the rights of others not participating in the fees must fall movement's protest. What, what's got to do with fees must fall? 
the last, uh, uh, well, not the last one, there's more, but I'll, I'll try and cut them down. The next one is uh, on page 82, the paragraph just before, where he says, the version of the applicant that he was unaware of the existence of the court order referred to is inconsistent with the facts placed before the court. It is devoid from any logic. The applicant was one of the co-leaders of the Fees Must Fall movement. It is unlikely that he, as one of the leaders of the said movement, would not have knowledge of the court order, especially as the court order was granted on the 25th April 2016. Even I cannot follow that logic, quite apart from the fact that the two things have nothing to do with each other. Um, and then this, this one takes the cake. On at, at page 83, this is his uh, big moment now of suggesting the exceptional circumstances. This is the sum total of this, the, the exceptional circumstances. The exceptional circumstances in this instance will then be the prevailing circumstances that existed at the campus of the university. The inference is inescapable that the applicant has a tendency to commit the type of offenses as leveled against him. There is no basis for a belief as suggested by the applicant that he was arrested simply because he is one of the leaders of the Fees Must Fall movement. Once again, the word tendency is uh, incongruent with the propensity that we've already dealt with. But these are just uh, extra uh, it's not as if we have a shortage of illustrations of how wrong the learned magistrate was. Okay. Um, so, my lord, in, 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 in rounding off, <clears throat> mm. what we have here is a situation where, let's start right at the beginning. The appellant was made a victim of spurious, uh, contrived, trumped up, and laughable charges, if it was not, not so serious. And having been lumped with those, then taken to a bail uh, application where there was uh, big promises of uh, implicating him in this or that activity, which will uh, show his so-called propensity or tendencies, which all came to zero. And then, as if that was not enough, we have a situation where his very legitimate fears that this was all a, a political uh, trick as envisaged in all the cases and all the discussions and all the articles that deal with section 64, uh, leaves us with no doubt whatsoever that actually this so-called trial that we're even talking about will never see the light of day. It is doomed to fail. It is still born because it is tainted by uh, political maneuverings and by uh, activities on the part of the prosecution, which uh, might well result in the removal of the NTPP if the case of Yengen is anything to go about. And, and if the appellant carries out his threat that he has instructed his legal representatives to pursue the matter, to quash these charges on the basis alone of the political interference. I, I venture to say, my, my Lord, that the chances of that succeeding are quite uh, 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 overwhelming because the connection is irresistible that this so-called meeting, uh, political meeting happens on the Monday and before the following Monday even arrives, the leader of the Fees Must Fall movement is in jail. And uh, all sorts of uh, efforts are put, or obstacles are put in his way uh, to, to, be, to write his examinations, to participate in his, in his legitimate political activities, and to be a student and to protest like anybody else. And all that is done with the greatest respect, with the intention, the clear intention to intimidate all other students and to ensure that they see the example of this. This is what can happen to you if you take on the mighty uh, state of the minister, the president, and the NDPP.
in the in the circumstances, my lord, uh, we would, uh, in terms of section section fifty five four, mm. humbly pray that uh, this court, uh, apart from setting aside the decision of the of the magistrate, when the time comes, uh, expresses its disapproval of the conduct of uh, the parties that have ensured that uh, the appellant's liberty is uh, adversely affected in such a manner for the past uh, three weeks now where he has been sitting in police custody. And accordingly, my Lord, even though at the, at the magistrate court level, we had made an, an offer for bail to be set at the level of 1,500 rand. Knowing what we know now, uh, which we did not know then, uh, I would venture to say, my Lord, this is the appropriate case where the appellant, like all the other students who had been arrested, or most of them, because I don't know all, should be released on warning uh, on the, so that in the unlikely event that his trial will ever eventuate, um, then he should be um, almost, quote unquote, uh, compensated for the injustice that has, he has been visited upon him deliberately. Um, my Lord, your Lordship, again, uh, I'll take the liberty, if my learned colleague objects, he will, will also, can take into account the fact that it is indeed uh, time for examinations. This is a postgraduate student, uh, a law student at that, and um, obviously he might have missed some of his examinations, and, um, but the sooner he, he comes out of uh, where he is now, the sooner it is that arrangements could be made that he might do oral examinations and all those kinds of, 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 of uh, expediencies that can be used to ensure that he does not lose his academic career uh, forever. And, and, and therefore, my Lord, the, the, the prayer that we ask for is for to, to set aside the decision of the learned magistrate and uh, to release the appellant uh, on warning. And we, if, if I may, my Lord, just yes. humbly pray that given the length of time that uh, Mr. Lamine has already spent, if your Lordship is inclined to grant us the, an order at the very least, even if the reasons would follow uh, subsequently, because uh, the nature of the papers and some of the complex issues that uh, uh, arise from from the from the from the cases, as the court pleases, I'm indebted to your lordship. Thank you. The state. <clears throat> Any response? My lord, I note the clapping of hands in the gallery um, for Mr. Mpofu's performance. Uh, my lord, uh, will note I have. In Indeed, uh, I have indeed filed heads of argument yeah. in the matter. Heads. There is a reference to an unreported judgment that I have a copy of uh, yeah. Can for I His Lordship, it? perhaps if that could be submitted. <coughs> for purposes, for the benefit of the persons uh, observing the proceedings, my Lord, I would like to quote at paragraph one of the said judgment, Hots versus the University of Cape Town, my Lord, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I, I forgot to hand up the, a copy of the unreported judgment. That I oh, yes, yes. Let's go, sorry. I thought you thought I was learned enough to know. <laughs> to know it off my head. <laughs> my okay. Lord, uh, paragraph one of the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment delivered uh, on the Paragraph one. Paragraph one. It is quoted in my heads of argument. Yeah. A judgment delivered by the Supreme Court of Appeal on the 20th day of October 2016 reads as follows. This appeal is not about the merits or legitimacy of those protests. It involves no judgment on the conflicting views of the students and their supporters, the university <coughs> administrators, the politicians, and Where others caught Mr. up Robert? in these events. Hello. Where are you reading? From paragraph one, my lord. It is quoted in paragraph seven of my heads of argument. You're reading the judgment now. Indeed so, my paragraph lord. Paragraph one. Indeed so, my lord. Well, mine says, since March 2012, 15. 
South African universities, blah, 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 blah. Indeed, so it carries on further down. Oh, so you're reading from the middle of the sentence. Yeah, this appeal is okay. not about the merits okay, or legitimacy. Fine, fine, fine. Okay. My Lord, in essence, what the Supreme Court of Appeal said, yes, there is a protest underway. Yes, there are people who support the protest. Yes, there are people who are against the protest. It's not the role of the court to determine who is right and who is wrong. Yeah. The role of the court is to uphold the law relative to the conduct of parties around these things. Mm. Here, talk about political motives, I would submit, is not an issue for this court to consider. The issue for this court to consider is simply one. Was the magistrate wrong in denying bail to the appellant? <clears throat> I just uh, wish to say, and I'm surprised by my learned friend's address, as I understood we had um, an understanding amongst colleagues um, and I feel it prudent to place on record at this stage that I take exception to my colleagues' suggestions or innuendo that I would go against my oath as a prosecutor to prosecute without fear, favor, or prejudice, and my oath to the High Court. I see my colleague, he wants to speak, but he's had his turn, my Lord. My, my Lord, okay, okay. Mr. I, I don't believe these are proceedings where he's entitled to interject my address, my Lord. No, no, Mr. Pope, my, let, uh, my Lord, Robert, yes. Finish uh, first. I don't know. Uh, Have you finished? No, my Lord. Yeah. I, I no, no, just make your submission first. Th that submission, okay. Yeah. Just okay. My, the submission. my Lord, the point that I want to make, mm. his papers are clear that there's a political motive. Mm. His papers are clear that there's a suggestion that the NDPP and the Minister of Justice and the President of the country met to discuss fees must fall. That is not in dispute. Whether the case of Mr. Dlamini was discussed is unknown to myself, is unknown to my colleague, and is unknown to the court. Then to come to, to court and suggest that there's a political motive, especially on my part, considering I've taken two separate oaths to uphold the law, my Lord. I take tremendous exception no, to no, that. No, no, I don't think he was referring to you per se. My so Lord, he made it clear to me prior to court no, that well, he would make it clear, I'm and he failed about, to do sorry, so. I'm talking about what I have heard in court. Yes. Mr. Court, please, my Lord. What you said outside, I don't know. <laughs> Yes, my lord, with the greatest respect, I, I don't, I think this can be sorted out very quickly mm -hmm. so that my colleague can continue with his argument uh, uh, in a cool atmosphere. I'd like to publicly assure him that all the submissions that were made deliberately did not involve him. No, casting no aspersions on him personally. I take it for granted, my lord, that my learned colleague is doing his job as he was instructed by his superiors. As, and I have no doubt that uh, he's not part of, he was not part of any meeting at Lutuli House, nor was he uh, uh, acting in accordance therewith. And I hope that will uh, make him relax a bit. Let's go. My Lord, I'd just like to say in conclusion that as my colleague has said, we are not playing a game here. And we must be mindful of public perceptions that are created whilst we're addressing the court, my Lord. Mm. My Lord, be that as it may, um, in respect of the um, submissions of... I would like to thank my colleague then for his apology, my Lord. My Lord, in respect of the submissions regarding the so-called meeting at Latuli House, mm. we cannot dispute that there was a meeting there. We cannot dispute that it was um, said that it was about fees must fall. We cannot, however, <coughs> accept Sorry, the stenographer has some announcement to make. All the phones in the court. All the, all the phones. They must put them on flight mode. All the phones, cell phones. Okay, thanks. Or switch off, my Lord. All right, yeah. Submit would be the best. My Lord, in respect of <coughs> this uh, meeting that took place, as I've submitted, yeah. we can't accept... And there is no evidence to suggest that that meeting specifically said we must target Mr. Dlamini. We know that the country, in essence, was facing a crisis about the action of students. We know the conduct of persons in Bramfontein prior to this meeting and after to this meeting at Latuli House. We can't accept merely that this meeting is only about Mr. Dlamini. And further, my colleague, interestingly enough, says <coughs> in his closing submissions that because of something we didn't know, you should now release him on warning. But with respect, my Lord, Section 65, Subsection <coughs> 2, <coughs> the 
Civil Procedure Act is clear what this court can and cannot take into consideration during these proceedings. Further specifically, the magistrate in his reasons on page 47C of bundle A, the third paragraph from the bottom, when referring to paragraphs 19 to 22, which relate to oh, the... So, sorry, sorry, 47C. 47C, my lord. It's the last page of bundle yeah. A. Um, the magistrate refers to paragraphs 19 to 22, which were quoted by my colleague about political motive in the matter. Yeah. The contents of paragraph 19 to 22 of the notice of appeal was not placed before the court to consider. It does not form part of the evidence considered. The applicant must comply with the provisions of section 65, subsection 2 of Act 51 of 1977 in respect of the new fact in order to consider such evidence. That is merely a repetition of what section 65, subsection 2 states. But in addition to that, my submission is clearly this. We don't know what the contents of the meeting. We know the subject of the meeting, but we don't know the contents. We cannot accept, even as a new fact, that it was about Mr. Lamini's arrest. <clears throat> my Lord, I just want to then, my colleague has invited me to address the court in respect of the video footage. At no stage during the bail proceedings was it said, during these bail proceedings, video footage will be presented. The role of a bail court and a trial court is clearly distinguishable. There is ample case law which says a bail court must not convert itself into a mini trial court in determining the appropriateness of releasing a person on bail. The evidence presented during the bail application was clear by the investigating officer. There is video footage that shows the following. There was never an undertaking to say we will play this video footage in the bail court. That forms part of the evidence which the trial, will be, um, the trial court will be asked to consider, my Lord. In respect of the quashing of the charges, my Lord, <coughs> um, my learned friend on behalf of the uh, appellant is welcome. My Lord, perhaps if I could just ask, my colleague's team is uh, making a bit of noise. Um, my colleague is welcome to bring such an application for the quashing of charges, but again, it's not a factor for this court to consider. There's recent case law, which I'm sure we're all aware of, of the North Gauteng High Court, where the quashing of charges or the withdrawal of charges based on political motivation was recently decided, and it was decided that a trial court must consider if the political interference in the case is sufficient to do away with the charges, my Lord. I don't believe it necessary to go on further about um, political motivation in this case, my Lord, unless His Lordship wishes me to address it further. <coughs> my Lord, uh, there was also talk that, uh, or submission, that there's no evidence that the appellant will endanger public safety. I wish to highlight that page 24 of bundle A, uh, paragraph 13, my Lord, which forms part of the investigating officer's affidavit, which was submitted as evidence. Yeah. Reads as follows, my lord. In addition to this, the South African police services are currently investigating further matters contained in various police dockets against the accused, whereby he has incited protesters to commit acts of violence. The accused stated, whilst addressing protesting students, that they should identify students who are attending classes as well as police officials deployed on the campus in order to attack them at home. That was never addressed during the bail application and it has never been mentioned now on appeal. And I would therefore submit that the magistrate was entitled and correctly considered that in assessing the likelihood of committing a Schedule One offence, my Lord. It is further um, in paragraph 47 or page 47C of um, the magistrate's reasons, bundle A. <coughs> if I may quote there, it is the second paragraph from the top and third paragraph, which reads In paragraph 49 of the applicant's affidavit, Exhibit B, it was stated As a student, I intend to participate in ac academic activities. Include, including writing end-of-year examinations. Should I not be granted I, bail, I will suffer irreparable harm as I will not be able to complete my studies before finalization of this matter. This is in contrast to what is submitted in paragraph 16 of the Notice of Appeal, where it is said, the accused is the leader of the student. 
He was entitled to express the view that they would resist the decision of the university to reopen since the decision was taken without consultation, provided that they acted lawfully and without violence in so doing. I would again submit that that again shows the magistrate was correct in <coughs> accepting that there was a propensity to commit Schedule One offences. There is further in um, the judgment of the SCA that I have handed to the court in my heads of argument, my Lord, in paragraph 34, um, <clears throat> I quote the relevant portions of the judgment at paragraph 72 that says, given the vehemence with which the appellants expressed their complaints against the university and its management, it was probable that they would have continued their protest and the actions related to if able to do so. This admittedly is in civil proceedings, but is a finding of likelihood of continuing of committing certain actions, my Lord, which I submit this court uh, is entitled to consider that when considering the correctness of the magistrate's decision. <clears throat> my Lord, in respect of the video footage, um, it is indeed correct that the learned magistrate stated during the matter that he's not willing to make himself a witness to talk about the photographs. I would submit he did so correctly. I would further submit he is entitled to make findings about evidence presented before him during the bail application. He did that as well, and I would submit he correctly did so. He said, in the pictures he can see it's the applicant. He again repeats that in his reasons. I understand that the photographs provided before this honorable court are black and white copies of a poor quality versus the originals which I um, submit were in color and clear, which were dealt with in the bail application. In essence, the appellant is now asking this honorable court to assess the magistrate's assessment of the pictures without providing proper copies. The court, unfortunately, this court is bound to the record before it. This court can't see what the magistrate saw, putting this court in a difficult situation. <clears throat> Assuming the magistrate was correct, how does that uh, encapsulate the notion of uh, a propensity to incite violence? I'm a lord. Because, it's not sorry, it's one incident in the video, I take it. it it's a day of incidents, my okay, lord. Sorry. It's, it's separate incidents yeah. that transpire all on the 4th of October. Okay. My Lord, the submission and the finding by the learned magistrate mm. was that, and it should be seen in context of the fact that the appellant in his own affidavit talks about being a student leader, mm. talks about being a co-founder of the Fees Must Fall campaign, which commenced in 2015. Mm. Then the court, the magistrate, uh, the learned magistrate, I would submit, correctly found that the court order clearly states there, respondent number seven, all participants involved in unlawful protest action. And paragraph 4.2 clearly <coughs> stipulates how the notice must be brought to everyone's attention. No, no, let's have recourse to that uh, order. Where is it on page? Page 27. 27. Yeah. It is bundle A, my Bundle Lord. A, sorry. I yeah. apologize, my Lord. If I could submit, this is a, an order given by yeah, yeah, quite. two judges of this honorable court. My Lord, I, I apologize. My, my colleague has, has pointed it out to me yeah. that it is only one judge who gave this Not order. Quite, it was yeah. just delivered by one of his it colleagues. Was, it was delivered on behalf of... Uh, judge Barachabit, Barachabit, my Lord. Indeed, sir, my Lord. Okay. <clears throat> this order, sorry, not the order, the citation of the seventh respondent. Indeed, yes, my Lord. Respondents. 
participants in protest action engaged in unlawful activities. How do you unravel that? My Lord, I, having not been party to these proceedings, mm. I assume um, and I would submit what in all likelihood took place in these proceedings mm. is it would be impossible to expect the University of the Witwatersrand to identify, to identify mm. each individual by name mm. and to determine whether they are students or not. We know that there are persons involved in the protest who are opportunistic, if I could call it, who are not students, who are joining the protest for their own reasons, as they will not be uh, gaining any direct benefit at this stage. Um, so I would submit that was a, a sort of blanket. Everyone who is involved in unlawful activities, as we are unable to at this stage, and it would be impossible to identify 200 respondents, if mm. that would be the number. So it clearly shows um, everyone involved in unlawful activity at the university in respect of protest actions. Mm. And as indicated by the appellant himself, the protest actions commenced already in 2015. Mm. And I would submit in respect of this court order, we're not dealing with a lay person. We're, deal we're dealing with a postgraduate law student who would well know, firstly as a student leader, that there is such a court order and he would secondly know what is unlawful conduct in the protest and then he would thirdly know as a law student regardless in the absence of an order what conduct is acceptable during a protest the word peaceful and peaceful protest is not academic my lord and he would know that as a law academic my lord <coughs> my lord and i note my I would submit that that's where the learned magistrate finds the propensity to commit Schedule One offences. In addition to the evidence of the investigating officer of the additional dockets, which states that persons will be attacked at home, um, which, as I've indicated, um, was never contested during the bail mm -hmm. application. And further, my lord, the judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal yeah. that in essence says we can look at the conduct mm. and we can assess due to the method in which they are conducting themselves will they now stop conducting themselves in that manner so i would submit on that basis it covers the finding of section 64a and section 64e being present um, in denying the appellant his release on bail <coughs> my lord i, I just for um, Clarity's sake, wish to, in respect of the so-called promise to present the video evidence during the bail application, my learned colleagues uh, in their heads of argument on page 5, this is the appellant's heads of argument, mm. page 5, paragraph 14, quote um, the, the case they often refer to, um, the Krichler judgment, for lack of a better word, where halfway through um, in describing a bail application, it says, although it is intended to be a formal court procedure, it is considerably less formal than a trial. This evidentiary material uh, profit need not comply with the strict rules of oral or written evidence. Also, although bail, like the trial, is essentially adversarial, the inquisitorial powers of the presiding officer are greater. So that, again, I would submit covers the fact that the investigating officer says there is video footage and that video footage not being presented in court. There, there is no provision to prove an applicant for bail's guilt in a bail application. And in essence, presenting um, the video footage would be an attempt to do just no, that. No, 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 I don't understand it that way. At that stage, <coughs> we are, it's predicated on 60. A and 60 what? 64 A and 64 oh, E, my lord. That's it. Like Krichler says, it's one of the exclusionary exceptions. We say, he says they must be visited very, very slowly. <laughs> In, Are you with me? Indeed, sir, my lord. My lord, if I could submit, that is why the photographs mm -hmm. were submitted. The photographs, which is not disputed, is from the 4th of October, is not mm -hmm. disputed, that is a still of what happened, what is filmed on the 4th of October, was submitted in order uh, in terms of section 60 subsection 3. Um, the court hearing the bail application is entitled to and obligated to accept such evidence. Yeah, fine, but the finding, 
if I must say, by the magistrate to say it is indeed accused, but, so but and so. My Lord, that, that finding, <laughs> I would submit, is um, even in the absence of that finding, the investigating officer's affidavit that says there is video footage that shows the appellant doing this, 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 and this. And I note in that regard that mm. my learned friend attacks the... Um, I failed to find the, the word, but the, um, he calls it laughable charges. I note he's silent on the theft charge of riot gear from a security guard where the investigating officer expressly says there is video footage of the applicant stealing riot gear of a security officer. To say that is not a serious issue and to say that is a laughable charge, my lord, I, am, I cannot even take it further than to say I'm, I'm speechless in that respect, my lord. <coughs> my lord, um, in respect of the propensity to commit crimes, mm. uh, I, I would submit um, the learned magistrate correctly took into consideration the fact that on the 17th of October, the appellant indicated to the court that he was sitting a law of evidence test on the 18th and required to be released from custody for that purpose. It is clear from uh, the affidavit of uh, Sergeant Rafapa that that was followed up and was established firstly that the appellant was never registered for law of evidence and secondly in respect of all the courses that he was registered for there was no test that he or um, assignment that was due uh, on the 18th of October so it is clear he's again shown his propensity to lie to the court and I would submit um, I have a copy of the state versus Rudolph my lord before then is there no exculpatory affidavit, supplementary affidavit filed by the accused explaining that uh, he made a mistake? Yeah, patent. Uh, My lord, there was, there was a submission um, made on his behalf in court, but there's no evidence to the effect that he made a mistake. And What was the submission? The, My lord, perhaps if the court can bear with me, I will find the exact submission in the papers. My Lord, was the council who erroneously made the submission, or was council acting on strict instructions from the appellant? Uh, my Lord, I would I would believe that um, council was acting on strict instructions. Um, obviously, it is not contained in the record, but the proceedings of the day, mm -hmm. um, council would not make such a submission, um, and ethically, he could not make sub yeah, such right. a submission without an instruction um, from the. Uh, the appellant, my Is there a possibility that you could erroneously do so? I've never I would, heard of counsel. <laughs> my Lord, I, I <laughs> would... Making erroneous submissions. My Lord, I, I would submit, uh, if a counsel makes an erroneous submission regarding to the standing in our law, it is one thing, but to make an erroneous submission regarding the personal circumstances of your client is, is somewhat different, especially something as specific as I'm opposed to a remand because I have a test in law of evidence tomorrow mm. is, is something different. And, and that is covered in the affidavit of the applicant, the appellant. Uh, my no, Lord, I mean the statement that he's writing exams, is it uh, at, he nev he never postulated in the affidavit? It is not postulated in the affidavit of mm. the um, appellant, but it is in the affidavit of the respondent who through Sergeant Rafapa yes. states, Yesterday in court, the following was said and was followed up and found to be inaccurate. And it was not when the learned magistrate inquired from the counsel, um, what about his allegation that he has a test? It was never said, no, no, um, we never said he had a test. It's, we made a mistake about the subject. But did the magistrate perceive it? Um, my Good Lord, if, uh, if the court will just bear yeah, with fine. me. My Lord, it appears to be on page 59. Page 59. Uh, at line 4, the court says, yes, thank you. Maybe it just, this is now the court addressing the attorney of the applicant. Um, maybe it just slipped your mind, but the prosecutor emphasized this aspect. The submission by the prosecutor is that the applicant deliberately misled the court by claiming that he had to sit today writing law of evidence. 
Would you like to respond to the statement made by the state? The response then is, yes, Your Worship, and I apologize for not dealing with the aspect. Your Worship, my submission, Your Worship, is that I had actually at the break consulted with the accused to find out on that aspect. Your Worship, the accused, as, as instructed, that it was not his deliberate intent to mislead the court when that submission was made. Um, Your Worship, last week it was his honest belief that he will be writing a test, Your Worship, and it had also transpired that in actual fact the law of evidence, it was an honest mistake from him to mention law of evidence. He is registered for LLB degree, etc., 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 my Lord. So it is clear that the, the representation, if I could call it that, that he's writing law of evidence test comes directly from him. And as pointed out by uh, Sergeant Rafapa in obtaining evidence from the university, he's not registered for law of evidence, and even the subject he is registered for have no test. Had he, had he said, um, had it turned out that he was writing a test in another subject, one could almost, I would submit, understand why he made such a mistake. But to make a mistake, um, and I, I would submit, as students, we, we knew which tests we were writing because there was usually cramming involved the day before, my Lord, to uh, cover that and to say I'm writing law of evidence when you're not writing law of evidence is clearly an attempt merely to secure his release on bail timelessly on the 17th. If I could, in respect of um, the uh, propensity to commit uh, Schedule 1 offences, or in more accurate terms, to ignore court orders, I have a, a copy available for uh, His Lordship as well as for my learned colleagues of the State versus Rudolph 2010 Supreme Court of Appeal matter, the citation being 2010-1 SACR 262 SCA. Um, his Lordship will recall in that matter there was indeed a, a person admittedly charged with a Schedule 6 offence, but the, the test that the court applied was in respect of um, the propensity to commit Schedule 1 offences. And it is set out clearly there, um, if I may just find the relevant. <coughs> portion for his regarding the the case as a whole sets out where the uh, appellant in that matter there was a protection order against him by his by the complainant being his wife mm -hmm. and <clears throat> he had committed an offense against his wife in contrast to the court order and the court on that basis found it sufficient to refuse him bail based on his propensity to ignore court orders mm. and meeting the requirements in terms of section 64 subsection A. And I would submit that is the death knell to the, to the appellant's case, that he hasn't clearly established that he doesn't have this propensity to commit offences. But there, there, you would know, what's that judgment by Cameron? Faki. Is it Faki? Indeed, Sam Lord. Faki. Right, where the court order is brought to the notice of a, a person by being served. My Lord. Oh, I'm <laughs> splitting a <hairs. laughs> I, I would I would submit that point. That point was taken mm. um, by uh, the appellant's counsel mm. during the bail application. Okay. I would submit that is relevant when we're dealing with um, a charge of contravening a court order. A, a what? If there's a charge of contravening a court order, no, no, or contempt. the propensity to ignore court orders also notionally is encapsulated in uh, that concept. Because Lord, you've got to have the intention. In, indeed, sir, my Lord, my Lord, but, but that knowledge of the court order, yes. um, I would submit, um, can be inferred from the role he himself describes himself as. I'm a student leader, yeah. I'm at the forefront of the protest action, and regardless of the court order, we have this additional information of mm -hmm. let's identify the students, let's identify the police, and let's attack them at home. That evidence is before the court, and there was nothing to contest that. There was no allegation of that never happened. To come now during the appeal proceedings and to say that evidence mm -hmm. will be challenged later flies in the face of section 65, subsection two which prevents this court from yeah. hearing those considerations. Mm. 
Okay. And my Lord, I would submit that the uh, learned magistrate correctly found um, in light of the court order or alternatively in the absence of the court order and the other conduct as per the SCA judgment that there was indeed a real likelihood as I do not dispute that the test that my learned friend has given for a likelihood, mm -hmm. but my issue is that there is a likelihood. And the learned magistrate correctly found that there is a likelihood and on that basis correctly refused the appellant bail, my Lord. <clears throat> for those reasons, my Lord, I would submit that the appellant has failed to show in terms of section 65, subsection 4, that the learned magistrate was clearly wrong in refusing um, the release of the appellant on bail, unless there is something further his lordship wishes any, to hear me on. As the court please. Mr. Mpofu, any response? As the court pleases, my lord. My lord, uh, I will ask my learned junior, Mr. Ngaitobi, to do the reply. Okay. As the court pleases, my lord. Yes, Mr. Ngaitobi. Thank you, my lord. My learned friend for the state has done very little to disturb the presumptive position that obtains in judgments in cases of this nature. And that, you, Your Lordship, will see from the judgment that we cite in our heads of argument at page 6, paragraph 16. It's a judgment by Justice Kachalia when he was acting as a, a judge in the um, WLD. The presumptive position, and it's repeated in at least three portions of that judgment, is that the fundamental objective of the institution of bail in a democratic society is based on freedom, and it is to maximize personal liberty. And your Lordship will see that at, towards the end of the page. And then if you turn the page to page seven, um, there's a citation, a useful citation from the judgment by Justice Harcourt in S. Versa Smith. The court will always grant bail where possible and will lean in favor and not against the liberty of the subject, provided it is clear that the interests of justice will not be prejudiced thereby. And then the last judgment is S versus uh, Archison. It is a wild-sighted judgment, a, just, a judgment by Justice uh, Muhammad. The court will therefore ordinarily grant bail to an accused unless this is likely to prejudice the ends of justice. So what we know as a matter of law is that the presumptive position is that a court must grant bail. And then it is only in circumstances that are proven. And there the burden of proof then rests on the state where it is proven that the interests of justice do not warrant the granting of bail in a particular set of circumstances. Today we no longer, of course, have to rely on the presumptive position at common law because this was the position prior to the introduction of the Constitution. Because, of course, today we have Section 35 of the Constitution that entrenches as a constitutional right the entitlement of an accused to be released, provided that the interests of justice uh, do not require otherwise and on reasonable conditions. So not only do we have the presumptive position in common law that is in favor of a release of an accused, but we also have an entrenched constitutional provision that operates the, the other way around. The state seems to take the view that it's actually the opposite, that the accused must in fact be kept in incarceration unless he can show that the interests of justice require his release, whereas the actual correct legal position is that he must be released unless the interests of justice require his continued uh, incarceration. Now, having clarified what the correct legal position is, let me just deal then with some of the aspects that our learned friend for the state uh, mentions. So let's start with the political considerations we don't accuse uh, our learned friend personally of being party to any act of political consideration, but we accuse the institution of the NPA. We accuse in particular Mr. Sean Abrahams for having an inappropriate meeting at Lutulu House with politicians to discuss about what approach should be taken in relation to the fees must fall. That we say has been deprecated upon by a full bench of this court, which makes it clear that the very meeting itself regardless of the content of the meeting, the very meeting itself is unconstitutional. Why? Because it creates the perception that the prosecution is not prosecuting in accordance with law. In other words, it's failing to fulfill its constitutional mandate under Section 179 of the Constitution to prosecute, as they say, without fear, without bias, and without favor, or and without prejudice. So when they meet politicians, and they tell us publicly that we will be discussing the fees must fall. Of course, the public is entitled to be alarmed at what actually happens in relation to the institution of the NPA. 
This is not an irrelevant nicety that we are introducing in these proceedings. This is a matter of fundamental importance because, of course, like any trial, bail proceedings themselves must appear to the public to be fair and they must appear to the public not to be influenced by the malevolent influence of politics. So the fact that today we are dealing with a bail and not dealing with a trial does not mean that your lordship should close your eyes to a fact that is now known. My learned friend, quite correctly for the uh, state, admits that all of the facts that we are relying upon to make the political considerations point are true. Well, if that is so, he has no basis to say they must nevertheless be excluded. This is not a new fact on appeal. This is a fact that Mr. Lamini made pertinently in his uh, uh, application when he submitted his affidavit. The only thing that has now shifted is that as a consequence purely of coincidence or accident, we now know that the meeting in fact did take place and that as a matter of fact there was a discussion about the fees must fall uh, movement. Who is to say that in that discussion Mr. Lamini's topic did not come up? Who is to say that the state's approach to bail would not be discussed at that meeting? Nobody knows. And this is precisely why, as a matter of perception, it is vital that the independence of the NPA must be protected. This is why it is vital that the head of an institution as important as the NPA should not go about having meetings with politicians, particularly to discuss matters where it is on anybody's version inevitable that there will be prosecutions. Now, that is the point that we make, that your lordship should take into account that we are not dealing with an ordinary case of an accused trying to get himself some liberty in order to enjoy his Christmas, but we are dealing with a case where we actually can see the beginnings, the foothold of the interference with the independence of the NPA. And what is particularly concerning here is that the person that is at the uh, 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 forefront of permitting this level of interference is the head of the institution itself. This is precisely, we have been here before, this is precisely what happened in 2002 in relation to Mr. Bulelani Nguk. And that is why this court was moved to express in no less than three passages its disapproval of the fact of a meeting between Minister Maduna and Mr. Bulelani Nguk. And it said the fact of that meeting was sufficient to destroy the perception that the NPA must act independently, without fear, without favor, without prejudice, and without, without uh, bias. Yeah. Uh, how does it percolate to the conduct, and I'm, I'm making it in inverted commas, to the conduct of the bail application in that a charge sheet was drawn? Precisely. What with? A charge sheet was drawn. Subsequent to that meeting, or obviously subsequent to that. No, it was all of this was subsequent. subsequent In fact, the arrest the, itself. Yes, everything was, is subsequent. Yes, the so arrest you're itself. The proceedings are tainted. Precisely, they are tainted at root, because the, what happens subsequent to that? Your lordship will remember mm -hmm. that even the allegations about violence were known allegations throughout. Even the allegations about the fees must fall across the country were all allegations that were known. But the fact that the situation must now be, in effect, militarized, and that the state must take a position that is hardlined towards the uh, uh, protesters is everything that occurred subsequent to that meeting. So in a sense, that meeting is the turning point in the approach of the state to the Fees Must Fall movement. Prior to that, we now know, as a matter of public knowledge, that the approach of the state was engagement. But the fact that the approach of the state moved from engagement and it transformed itself to the policing of the situation, the militarization, the use of law and order is ultimately explained by that malevolent meeting. And that meeting, it is inevitable, was only intended, what on earth could be the reason why the Minister of Justice would want the NDPP to come to that meeting? What could be the reason why the president would want the NDPP to come to that meeting? If it is not to express their political views to the NDPPP on how they should deal with the fees must fall. And quite apart from the fact that why would the NDPP agree to go to this meeting? So ultimately, to answer your Maybe question. they just drink tea, you know? Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> In the world of possibility, one can never exclude that. But what we know for a fact, my lord, is that they have told us 
that we met and we discussed the fees must fall. So not only did they drink tea, after the drinking of the tea, they discussed the fees must fall. So that is, on the facts that is unknown, that is um, admitted. Mr. Robin says I'm not to be seized with uh, any factors which are excurial the, the record of the bail application. Yes. It says, uh, quotes this case from the SCA. Well, I will deal with that case oh, of the okay. SCA in a moment, right, but okay. let me finalize this point. Okay. Your Lordship will remember in the case of S versus Yengen, mm -hmm. the case was not precisely about whether or not that meeting was appropriate. It was about the prosecution of Mr. Yengen. Yeah. But the judge said, and this is a passage that Mr. Mbofu cited, paragraph 52, mm -hmm. that it is ultimately my responsibility as the court to safeguard the, in the independence of the institutions that are primarily tasked with the enforcement of the rule of law. So it is true that there is no specific factual allegation mm -hmm. that says Mr. Damini's case served before the ministers. Mm -hmm. But it is ultimately the court's job to safeguard the independence of the NPA itself, sometimes against the NPA itself. And that is why this is absolutely vital to the submissions that we make, that we will be asking your lordship not only to release Mr. Lamin on bail, but also to make your lordship clear that in relation to that meeting, it was an inappropriate meeting to have in the first place, regardless of the content of the meeting. But the perception remains that the office of the NPA should not be having meetings with politicians to discuss matters where it is inevitable on anybody's version that prosecutions would ensue consequent upon that meeting. So let me I'll close that topic and move on to the next topic. Our learned friend then refers to the SCA judgment in HOTS okay. and versus UCT. Yeah. Firstly, let's point clear that that judgment is clearly distinguishable from what we are dealing with. What had happened, I went through the judgment uh, earlier this morning, but what had happened on the facts of that case is that the, there was a student boycott about the same topic, fees must fall. But UCT, unlike VITS, did not respond by prosecuting those students. Rather, it brought an interdict. So what was being debated at the Supreme Court of Appeal was the ambit of the interdict, whether or not the interdict should have been granted in the sense whether or not the elements of, the, of an interdict should have been uh, were satisfied on the facts of that case. Mm. Justice Wallace ultimately concluded that although the requirements of a final order were met, the interdict itself was too wide because it precluded the students from attending on campus and that violated their rights to freedom of movement as contained in the Bill of Rights. And on that basis, he varied the terms of the court order. So it was in the context of that discussion that Justice Wallace made the point. My learned friend says one of the points that he makes is that you could judge from their previous conduct whether or not they were likely to repeat the subsequent conduct. But what he overlooks in that judgment is that what had happened actually in the middle of the judgment, the court put to counsel who acted for the students the possibility that they would agree in order that would enable them to continue with their uh, uh, boycott, but it would exclude the so-called unlawful elements. Counsel for the students rejected the terms of that order. It was in response to that rejection that Justice Wallace then says, I can deduce from the fact that your counsel in court has been offered an order that would enable the students to return to campus, plus to continue their boycott, but to exclude the unlawful elements, that in fact they are likely to continue with the unlawful conduct. It was not like the facts that we are dealing with in this case, something that is based purely on conjecture and nothing else that you are now having this propensity to commit further acts of violence. So the case is clearly distinguishable. Now, let's then go to the third topic, which is, well, what do they actually say about the facts of this case? What do they rely on? They rely on three things. One, on the court order. But let's look at the court order. The court order has now been discredited convincingly by Mr. Uh, Mr. Mpofu, my learned friend. But if that still does not convince your lordship, let me give you three reasons why the evidence of the court order simply should be uh, disregarded. One, Mr. Dlamini is not identified as a respondent. That is common cause between the parties. Number two, 
it is not clear what the cause of action was. Was it a strike by workers? Was it a strike by academic staff? Was it a strike by students? This was an event happening in April. It had nothing to do with the FISMAS fall movement of September. So we don't know whether or not there is any nexus whatsoever in relation to the cause of action between that event and the event that we are dealing with here. Thirdly, there is just no evidence that the terms of that order were ever brought to the attention of Mr. Zamini. We know from the judgment of Feki, and that's a judgment by Justice Cameron, that an essential element in relation to a contempt of court, which is a civil standard, uh, applying criminal law in a civil context, is that the order must come to one's attention. My learned friend cannot draw this artificial distinction that, oh, well, Feki dealt with, uh, uh, with uh, contempt of court and we're dealing with bail. Because as Mr. Mpofu submitted to your lordship, what is still essential is that the propensity must be established on a balance of probabilities. So they cannot establish it by conjecture or guesswork. They must establish it by fact. So once we have these three elements, failure to identify, the uh, disconnect in terms of the cause of action, and the fact that the court order, there is no evidence it was uh, brought to the attention of the appellants. Now, um, yes. Oh, yes, uh, I think. Yes, and then the case that my learned friend relies upon, which is the S versus Rudolph. It's a 2010-1 SACR 262 SCA. What is most vital about that case is paragraph 14 that my learned friend does not read to your lordship. Because paragraph 14 says the following, and this is the person now who has the propensity to disregard court orders. The interdict was served on him on 30 March 20, 2009, less than a month before the incident. The date for confirmation was set for 13 July 2009. So here we have it quite clear that the terms of that interdict were brought to the attention of the accused person who was then subsequently accused of this propensity to disregard court orders. But this is chalk and cheese. We are not in that world whatsoever on the facts of this particular case. Now, that dispenses with the court order argument. Okay. Then what else do they have? They say that there is video evidence that show the accused in particular compromising positions. My learned friend, Mr. Mpofu, has dealt with the video evidence. There is no video evidence, period. It is not as if there is some video evidence that is coming. The fact is that for bail proceedings, what we are dealing with today is that there is no video evidence, period. We must start from that premise. This appeal is confined to the record that is before the court. The mere fact that the police is to produce a video and does not uh, produce that video cannot now be construed, as my learned friend seems to suggest, that, oh, well, he's, he was saying that he has it. It is in his bedroom. That is not the issue. The issue is that he, if he has it, it must come to court. The second point to be made about this is this suggestion that somehow these photographs are linked to the video footage. We have no such evidence that these photographs are linked to the video uh, footage. What we know about these two photos, as the magistrate correctly said, one photo shows the back of a man or a woman, who knows, but it shows the back of a person. The other photograph shows a person who has a mask on, a, a, mask, a security mask on. That is the full extent of what we know about these photos. Nothing more and nothing less. But then he says, uh, he makes a quantum leap and says, uh, that is the accused. Yes, it is a, a, a quantum leap in logic mm. and common sense. Because nobody, the magistrate in the trial, I mean in the bail application, was quite clear that mm. I cannot draw the jump mm. between this photograph and this accused person. Well, in the judgment, but he does exactly the very same thing that he said he was not going to do. So the lip does not actually work. In fact, it works in favor of the accused. So that dispenses with the video evidence. What else? So video evidence as well as the uh, photographs. Now, what else do they rely upon? They say that there are allegations of violence. There are allegations of the accused punching someone. But all of those depend ultimately on the video evidence. Because it would have been a different matter if the state had come to your lordship and said, well, forget about the video evidence. What we are relying upon is an eyewitness who was there on the day and witnessed the following 
occurrences. We don't even have an eyewitness. Their evidence is either the photographs or alternatively the video evidence. Not even someone who says, I actually saw Mr. Dlamini throw the stone. Or someone who says, I actually saw Mr. Dlamini punch someone. Sorry, no. I just want to check something. This lady, surgeon, doesn't she say, Ek was da? <laughs> Mr. Robin, does he say this? She doesn't say, I was there, I saw. Sergeant Rakapa was not present. She says she saw the video. So, so she's I, post facto. I, yeah, I just want to, to go to the paragraph because, well, my learned friend has helped me because I was going to go to the paragraph to make it clear that this is a sergeant who is talking about the observations from the video and not personal observations on the scene of the offense as it was unfolding. So as a matter of evidence, whether one applies the civil standard or the criminal standard, what we have is a photograph and nothing more. The promise of the video is irrelevant. What's the probative value? Because in bail, in bail proceedings, as you know, the standard may not be as high as uh, in a trial, where yes. it would be proof beyond reasonable, any reasonable doubt. Now, I'm applying the balance of probabilities. Okay. I am suggesting that even when mm -hmm. applying the civil standard, which mm -hmm. is the standard that should have been applied okay. in the bail hearing, they simply do not get off the starting blocks. Okay. Because all they have are two photographs as a matter of concrete, tangible evidence, and no more than that. Who can conclude that the interest of justice, which is a constitutional right to be released on bail, the interest of justice militate against the release of an accused based on two photographs, one of which shows a person in the back and the other, and the other one shows a person who has a, a mask on, where the magistrate says, but who is this? And nobody actually knows who it is. And the magistrate says, well, I'm not going to implicate myself and make myself a witness. Now what we have is, well, the judge himself must now make himself a witness and confirm that it was actually Mr. Lamini who is in this picture. It is boggling the mind. Now, the, the, the next topic is the issue of theft. They say, oh, well, what about the theft? But if the video evidence, my argument is right on video evidence, is correct, well, then the issue of theft doesn't arise at all. Then what they then say, well, how about this lie regarding the test? We must contextualize this from the correct legal standpoint. The question was not whether or not Mr. Damini lied. The question was whether or not there were any considerations based on Section 64, A and E, that would warrant his continued detention as opposed to his immediate admission to bail. The fact, of course, that he lies is a subsidiary issue that has to be taken into account in the assessment of the broader legal question. But it is wrong to substitute the legal question and then to elevate the question of the lie as if a lie itself is the test for the granting or refusal of bail. You cannot now use the refusal of a bail effectively as a form of punishment for having lied. So that is the correct legal question that had to be asked. But what do we say then on the facts? What we know on the facts, I went through as your lordship was engaging with my learned friend from the prosecutor. From the affidavit that Mr. Lamini gave, there is no reference there to a test on the law of evidence. What happens, he subsequently takes, uh, the attorney takes an instruction and then informs the prosecutor and then they conduct the investigation. But even that is subsequently explained before the magistrate, when the magistrate says, well, explain yourself. And there's an explanation given there. And the explanation essentially is that I thought there is a test. It turns out that there is no test. And one must take into consideration the context in which all of these events unfold. This is a student who is in custody. The university's standpoint throughout is that the classes must resume. And the res resumption of the classes involves the writing of tests. It is perfectly understandable that in the context of those conversations, this instruction could have been given, whether wittingly or unwittingly. Nobody knows. But the problem now is that we've now elevated this and ultimately concluded that based on this lie, you deserve a punishment. And this is the wrong approach that the magistrate uh, ultimately applied, because one cannot now sacrifice one's liberty because of an inconsequential lie. 
even if the state ultimately proved that this was a lie, it is still no evidence upon which the inference can be drawn that there is a propensity on the part of the accused either not to stand trial or whatever their case is, alternatively, most importantly, to commit a Schedule One offense or to be disruptive towards public peace. It's still not enough to draw that connection that the state ultimately had to draw. So yes, Mr. Mkabo lied about whether there is an exam or not, but that is not the correct legal question. And yes, the magistrate could have said, I am not impressed that you have misled me. Mm. But that is ultimately irrelevant to the legal question that had to be answered. So we have those two answers to this issue about the, the lie. Just one aspect. These are application proceedings, in essence. Yes. Are they not? They are. I mean, it's not like a man gets into the witness stand. Yes. And gives evidence viva voce. Are you yes. with me, Mr. Robin? Yes. This bail application was conducted on... <coughs> It was on Davis. paper, yes. Don't we confine ourselves primarily to the... Con I, I, I take the point that in argument you may make submissions, etc., etc. But I'm just thinking about the property value of uh, submissions which are inimical to the stated facts in the affidavits. So, yeah, maybe let's hear you there. Are you with me? Because these are application proceedings and uh, this... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just want to hear you before this thought escapes me. Uh, my Lord, <coughs> they are indeed application proceedings uh, in the papers, but by nature of yeah. the evidence or the affidavit of the investigating yeah, officer, yeah. that evidence is there okay. to say there was a request that I be released on bail early for this and this reason, and that is brought into the evidence then. It is part of the evidence mm -hmm. I would submit. Albeit it's not the appellant who himself says um, it needs to be seen in context in any event. The appellant is not he himself saying, I need to be released as I'm having a test because the bail application was heard on the day that he alleged to be having a test. So that is why it is included in the affidavit and it does form part mm -hmm. of the evidence. I'm not sure if there's... If you lie, if you lie in uh, court proceedings, are you damned forever? Depending, I would submit on the if context... You recant, I'm aware of decisions where you recant. Have you, you have heard, I mean, you're an experienced prosecutor. You have heard a witness uh, make a positive assertion that uh, he actually saw me kill Mr. Mpo. And when he comes to trial, he dissembles and says, uh, I heard that uh, Mr. Mpo was killed by Ratamu Khatim. Like the preference of uh, an explanation by Mr. by the appellant himself, doesn't it ameliorate the misleading a submission that he was misleading the courts in order to obtain bail or to be admitted to bail? My, my Lord, with, with respect, if if we compare the example that his lordship has given about the witness, we then expect of that witness to qualify why is this now different to what you've previously said and there's consequences for for changing that where in this instance there's never an explanation other than i didn't deliberately intend to do it there's okay. no this is why i did it it just says i didn't deliberately okay. intend to okay. do it and there's always a consequence not only of a changing of uh, a version is it a factor in terms of uh, section 60a and I, I would I would submit it is so. Look, looking at the the facts of the case globally, is my it lord. It's decisive. Um, it is not decisive on its own, but when weighed together mm. with the other conduct of the appellant, it must count heavily against him. Okay. The the so-called straw that breaks the camel's okay. back, my lord. I'm not sure if there's something further. Yeah, or there's one other aspect. Just uh, maybe it's about Mr. <coughs> Obetovi's uh, argument about. Uh, the constitutionality of uh, the unlawfulness, or even the unconstitutionality of the perceived meeting between the NP, DPA, aid to the minister and the president. <coughs> my Lord, um, I would be in you a... You say that's irrelevant. I, I would be in a difficult position to comment on that meeting. No, no, we don't know um, the contents, just the meeting. I, I that would, they met. I, I would it, submit it irrelevant. This, at this, this stage, it's irrelevant. This court shouldn't consider it. Indeed, sir, my lord. It doesn't change the proceedings. In, indeed, sir, my Nothing. lord. Nothing. Indeed, sir, my lord.
My Lord, spe specifically, um, if my uh, <laughs> learned friends are asking the court to consider... No, they are not doing that. It's the appellant himself who makes the allegation. If, if, the, if the, the... This incarceration and charge if the, are motivated by political considerations. If the appellant is asking this court to consider new facts, and if the is court... Is a new fact? My Lord, the content or the fact that there was a meeting is a new fact, as it was not known at the time, and it was not brought to the attention of the court hearing the application. Ah, so by definition, it is a new fact. A new fact need not necessarily take place after the event. It merely needs to come to light after the event. No, but it says, yeah, well, you see, I said my incarceration is motivated by political considerations. And two weeks thereafter, you see, here's the minister and the president and Mr. Abraham's meeting. M my Lord, <laughs> It would be um, a miss of me not to, at this stage, say mm -hmm. that if the court does want to consider no, that, no, no, no. I, I would add. I've been addressed on that. I would add that the court should also be mindful of the fact that the criticism of a number of mm -hmm. politicians and the like, saying that that meeting could never have been about fees must fall and could only have been about a specific fraud ah, prosecution. That's not that's not before us. <laughs> but, but, my Lord, neither is the content of the meeting. That's no, no, what I'm fine. saying. If you want to consider the meeting, you have to consider the No, but I'm told you, you said it's common cause that the meeting was about fees must fall, hashtag whatever. Yeah, indeed, sir, my Lord. Right. But it's not but common it was cause. Never about Pravin Gordon. And it was I never... I know you are alluding to that. Indeed, sir, my That's Lord. That's it. So, Pravin Gordon's story is not before the court. Uh, but, my Lord, the meeting, there's no common cause and there's no evidence that the was about student leaders or about Mr. Lamini himself. How do you talk himself. about fees must fall? We talk about the ANC without Nelson Mandela and Sisulu. <laughs> we say they met. They met uh, de Clark, and they talked about the liberation of South Africa. Indeed, sir, my lord. Yeah. My, my lord, but <laughs> I don't think we can read into the context of the meeting. The fact that a meeting No, no, happened, I hear you. We, um, for example, subsequent no, to that meeting... the magistrate says he's a leader of the Fees Must Fall movement. You see, it's not me saying that. It's, it's the magistrate. The appellant, in fact, my lord. Okay, but the magistrate encapsulates it in his reasons for refusing him bail to say even the police know that he's a leader of the movement called Fees Must Fall, and therefore he has this propensity for violence or inciting violence. My Lord. Yeah, um, I hear you. <laughs> uh, the, if I could just add, um, subsequent to that meeting, um, the NPA um, is required to deliver monthly statistics on fees must fall cases. In other words, how many matters there are arrests, mm. how many dockets are brought, mm. how many nollies, how many prosecutions, how After many... After the meeting with the politicians. After the meeting of the politicians. And the NDPP, um, with okay. respect, I is required to report such things to Parliament, my Lord. Okay. You remember Kendrick wrote a judgment, Mr. Mpofu, and Deputy, and you, Mr. Robin, what, when, when was acting in the SC... In the Constitutional Court, 1994, is it 1996? Between 95 and 97. Where it says notions of fairness and justice, it's no longer free for all. Our justice must be interspersed with uh, those notions of uh, fairness and you recall that, Jack? What uh, was I believe state? it is a uh, key versus attorney general yeah, yeah. Western Cape, oh, Western Cape. the double-edged sword of that, fairness. That indeed. is that. What do you... My, my Lord... In conjunction with the judgment by Preller and uh, Buttersman, State versus Yangen, if you take them together, can I just ignore that evidence about the meeting? My Lord, I would submit that it's difficult to consider yeah. the meeting without knowing what the meeting is about. No, just that it took place. That's not, the, not what was discussed, but that it took place and what was going to be discussed or discussed is the fees must fall movement, not what other appendages. My, my Lord, the, the double-edged sword, mm. I would submit... Doesn't it, apply here. Well, it's, it swings both ways, literally. Okay. Um, to say we have, and the submission of the respondent is, is this, we have a case here where there's a court order with offences yes, that are yes, committed yes, yes. in violation of the court mm -hmm. order. To now say because there was a meeting of politicians, that this case loses its legitimacy would be that double-edged sword only swinging one way. To say that that um, decriminalizes criminal conduct mm -hmm. because of a meeting, 
I would submit is not the finding that this court no, can no, make. No, 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 I'm not speaking that finding. Okay, I've heard you. Yes, as, sir. As the court leader. <laughs> Thank you, my lord. Um, the exchange was helpful, um, even if it didn't illuminate much in relation to what exactly is the state's case is, because they are stuck with the facts. They had their boss, ultimate boss, had this meeting. They cannot remove it. And they are also stuck with another fact that the meeting was about fees must fall, and that cannot be erased from the slate of history. It's just tough for my learned friend. Now, mm. what um, the last two points I want to make <coughs> is that um, we now know that the magistrate himself found that the accused is not a flight risk. In other words, yeah, yeah. if the possibility is, well, is he going to come to court or not, mm -hmm. it's clear that he will come to court. And then the final argument to be made is that what ultimately your lordship is concerned with is applying the interests of justice. Mm. And this is a broad standard. And we've shown your lordships, mm. the authorities, uh, yeah. prior to the Constitution, even subsequent mm. to the Constitution, that were in doubt uh, on the side of liberty. And what we've also shown is that this is an extraordinary case mm. where the head of the NPA is having these malevolent discussions with politicians on matters that will subsequently turn prosecutorial. And that on its own is a violation of the Constitution. A court cannot close its eyes on a violation of the Constitution, like Justice Preller and Justice Bettelsman did in the Yengen case. We are urging upon your lordship mm. to take that fact into account. And of course, it is true that in bail proceedings themselves will not be invalidated, but the fact that this took place is a material fact that your lordship should take into account. And then the, uh, 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 that it, and also it is a matter that we will be using in the trial. Okay. And then, of course, we have shown mm -hmm. that even if your lordship strictly applied the test under section 64A and E, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is that the accused should never have been denied bail. His bail should have been granted. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's just to repeat then that the correct order that we seek mm. is that he should simply be released on warning. Just like that. Who are free? Choose the Precisely, my Let lord. Let him fly. Precisely, my lord. And, uh, no conditions. Nix. Well, well <laughs> the question of the... No, I'm just the there are just no facts in this case mm. that would justify these uh, drastic and draconian uh, remedies that the state is insisting upon. They simply have not got no, the material facts. Should I... Should I be persuaded by your argument and accede to admitting the, not admit, I don't admit him, setting aside, set aside the order made by the magistrate and substitute the magistrate with myself. Shouldn't there be any conditions? Nothing. Um, my Lord, I will have to take instructions. I'm on my feet. Um, Sit down I'll, and take instructions. Yes, I'll have to take, <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to take instructions on, 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 on that. Uh, yeah, okay, yes. whilst you're doing that. <laughs> Assuming I'm with uh, the appellant, what do you think about conditions? My, my Lord, if I could be so bold as to suggest that the court order of the 25th of April 2016 is in paragraphs 3.1.1 to 3.1.1. 3.1.7. What is it? What page? Page 27 and 28 of 27 and 28. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, those would be... No, uh, no, but I'm not with you. It's on, 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 on A. Bundle, bundle A, my lord. Bundle A. Yep. Yep. On page 20? Of page 27 and 28. Oh, okay. It's the court order of the um, Gauteng Local Division. No, no. I'm not um, with you. Let me check the other. Oh, yeah, you're right. 27 and 28. Um, where it reads, the respondents and other persons participating in protest actions are oh, interdicted and restrained from. From there below that, it should say, the accused may not unlawfully occupy in those exact conditions. Um, there would be no need, um, my Lord, to include a, um, a reporting condition. Oh, no, no, quite well. So you're saying 3.1? 3.1.1. Right. 3.1.7. Uh, up to 3.1.7. All seven of those conditions uh, or um, actions that, Why the, seven? that they were interdicted against. Oh, I see. 
Okay, but it, it, uh, it goes, my Lord, if I could just uh, submit, it goes further than that yeah. in the sense of um, where the accused or the appellant would reside um, as he was resident at the university. So he's still resident there. Um, I've, I understand from the university prior to the bail application that they will try and accommodate him at an alternative um, residence. The problem with that being there was no indication what would happen at the end of the academic year. Perhaps my learned colleagues are in a better position to indicate that to the court. Okay, let's hear. Let's um, my Lord, I've discharged my mandate. My yes. leader is now taking over. Oh, is that okay? <laughs> 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 yes. As a court pleases, my Lord. My Lord, is uh, uh, delegating upwards, my Lord. <laughs> my Lord, with the greatest respect, mm. there, there is no basis upon which uh, the state, given the facts that we have been we have traversed all day, can seek now to smuggle a an interdict yeah, no, I saw that. through the back door. I'm sorry. Yeah. It cannot happen like that. Mm. What is needed here, my lord, with the greatest respect, the reason why we even uh, were suggesting that the monetary part of the of the order should no longer hold. Uh, as your lordship says, recanting <laughs> the, w w what we offered in the in the magistrate's court is simply because of the facts that have been traversed here of what has transpired. The fact of the matter, my lord, is that the chances that this prosecution will ever see the light of day are zero, and therefore the court has to take that into account. How that do, is how do you know that at this stage? Well, because my lord, as we are saying, given the the instruction that has been given. Uh, to the attorneys to quash the, the charges on the basis of oh, the okay. of the of the Lutuli House uh, tete a tete. Hundred percent success. Eh? It, it, absolutely. <laughs> well, ninety ninety. Let's let's say ninety percent then, my lord. Uh, just so that we are not over optimistic. Mm. But on a serious note, my lord, the point of the matter is that even if one when one inspects the nature of the charges as we have done, when one inspects the surrounding circumstances. When one inspects the fact that the accused has now uh, sat in, in custody for, for three weeks and the possibilities of a successful uh, prosecution, then uh, with the greatest respect, my Lord, what is it that uh, Mr. Jamini will be running away from? Because remember, the purposes of all these conditions is to ensure that he actually stands trial. No, no, but fine. on these facts, I would love to stand trial, my Lord, if I were him. Mm. So, in fact, we should be paying him uh, rather than him paying any any bail, but my lord, we, we are prepared uh, for this. Uh, Mr. M Mr. Lamini could uh, report once per month at the Hillbrow Police Station, and if he ceases to be a student at the University of the Witwatersrand, he would have to report that fact to the investigating officer, uh, and that's that is all, my lord. And then he remains a uh, resident at the student address. Th that's correct. And if he changes address, whether it's a residential or the student one, he will also have to, re to report that to the investigating officer. Is that it? That's it, my lord, I'm afraid. Here's the court, please. Thank you. My lord, with respect, I don't see um, the conditions that uh, suggested by the respondent, yeah, no 3.1.1 3 to 3.1.7, in essence, come down to you will not commit criminal mm -hmm. activities at the university. It is not trying to sneak things in through the back mm -hmm. door. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps, um, I, I don't, bearing in mind that the, the original finding was that there is not a flight risk, I, I don't see the need of a reporting condition. Yeah, the reporting condition of should he cease to be uh, no longer be a student at the university, that should be um, reported. And um, only once he ceases to be a student should he then report once a week to the investigating officer as uh, he will then have a new address which would have to be followed up in any event, my Lord. Okay. But, um, that being said, my Lord, obviously the respondent is still of the view that Section 65.4 has not been complied with. Yeah, I hear you. Mr. Mpofu, what about the fact that, you know what, in, you can just be upright. In normal uh, bail appeals, I'll, I'll deliver an extempore judgment. 
Yes, my lord. But in, this, in the case of this nature, what's your view about it? Well, my lord, uh, I, 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 I sympathize with your lordship. Mm -hmm. As we, we all know, the bail mm -hmm. appeal is by its nature urgent. My yeah, lord. that's it, yeah. I would propose, my lord, that your lordship, uh, after considering the matter, would at least grant the order and, uh, and, and reserve the, the question of, of the reasons. Uh, and if any party really seeks the reasons at a later stage, then we can deal with that. Uh, um. Mr. Robin, come on, tell me. <laughs> my, my Lord, um, the, the urgency, um, it should be noted that the respondent was willing to enroll the matter um, without proper procedures having been followed in the pagination of papers, the confusions of bundle A and bundle B. So we understand the need for urgency. Um, I'm, in, I'm in his lordship's uh, hands uh, okay, when, when his lordship okay. wishes to give a, a ruling in the matter. Right. Okay, thanks for all sorts of counsel. That's good. Right, for the erudite submissions. I'll just have to consider the submissions for two days. I'm sorry about the length of time. Friday, I'll give a judgment written fully or a ruling, okay? If I'm not ready, I'll just make a ruling. Either way, if you're a betting man, you know where I'm going. <laughs> okay, is that sufficient? I'll try, I'll try and deliver a full judgment by Friday. It's Tuesday today. You see, this court is so busy. It's Tuesday today. Is Hello? it Tuesday? If, uh, no, it is, it's... Um What's today? It, it is Tuesday, my lord. Tuesday. My lord, Tuesday. if, if okay, I may... let's make it Thursday. Let's make it Thursday. Ma Shh. Ma so ma 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 my lord, with the greatest respect, we, we would appeal. My lord, uh, if... No, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, let, let me just get this out of my chest, yeah, my lord. Yeah, do, do. The, 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 the bureaucratic red tape that yeah. is associated with getting this matter to court... Okay. is a matter that I, I, I'm, I think I'm going to write an article on, my lord. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the past three weeks have been hellish uh, for, the, for the appellant. Okay, I hear. okay, I'll make a ruling tomorrow then. I won't write the judgment. Then. I'll just make a ruling, a ruling and subsequently tomorrow. I'll give you reasons. The reasons. Is that okay, Mr. Robin? As court, please. I'm, I'm in the court's hands. Yeah, right. okay. My lord, if I'm, may I be excused and uh, send one of my juniors yeah, to note the judgment? Ten o'clock, my lord? No judgment, you see. A ruling. Uh, uh, rather, the ruling, my lord. Right. At, at 10 o'clock, my lord? Yeah, 10 o'clock, I'll make a ruling. And then the judgment will follow within 14 days. If, As a, if I could ask a similar indulgence, I believe my colleague is before... Mr. Ms. Williams. Uh, I will request from her merely yeah. to note the ruling okay. tomorrow then. Okay, fine. Court, yeah. All right, so 10 o'clock. Rom, so. As it pleases the court. <laughs>
Sebisi Jonas is a patron of the association. In his address, he said everyone in the country should be concerned about the threat of a credit rating downgrade to junk status next month. He then said boosting economic growth should be the number one priority for the country, followed by dealing with corruption. Part of the na new national obsession that we need to build is an obsession about renewed growth and inclusive growth, as well as vigorous industrialization and reducing those constraints that prevent us from, from growth. The second national obsession should be with constructing a government that is stronger, more capable, and less corrupt. That is another obsession, national obsession that should be part of the national conversation that we are having. Speaking after Jonas, the ANC head of economic transformation, Inok Godongwan, reiterated the ruling party's support for Finance Minister Pravin Godan with respect to the efforts by the Hawks and National Prosecuting Authority to lock him up. When we talk about what is happening with Pravin, for us it's not the individual Pravin. It's the institutional integrity of Treasury and the independence of the South African Reserve Bank. Those are key things, institutions, that have got to be protected. If Pravin presents a fiscal framework, everybody has got to have confidence in that fiscal framework. If you take the jockey, who's going to ride this horse? Former Finance Minister Trevor Manuel and former Public Protector Tulima Donsela are scheduled to address the conference shortly. Activity in the residential property market continues to be hit by the country's economic low growth. But FNB's property mortgage barometer says home loan repayments remain solid. It suggests that the property sector has some resilience at the moment. It's been a tough year for South Africans, with the economy expected to show almost no growth in 2016. That poor growth has hit the residential property market, which saw a slowing down in the volume and value of home loans. When you look at new bonds, uh, value of new loans granted, home loans granted, according to the NCR data, by the second quarter you're already running at minus 1%. So it's all broad slowdown, but in terms of market growth, it's not there anymore. But in terms of financial stress, not a bad situation. We've had some mild increase in arrears levels, non-performing loans. According to FNB, if you do own a residential property, you can expect it to grow by an average 3% next year after an expected 5.1% for this year. But what are the chances of you selling your property next year? And will there be healthy buyers out there? Well, FNB's mortgage barometer shows that home loan transactions made by individuals declined by 6.3% in 2016 as a whole. It will continue to decline next year by a slower 2%. A longer time on the market before sale, I think, reflects uh, a more ch an, uh, an increasingly challenging environment for sellers at this stage, which is to be expected given that demand has slowed. John Luce believes the Reserve Bank is done with interest rate hikes for the time being and will keep interest rates at current levels, where prime is at 10.5% through 2017 and 2018. He says expected stable interest rates and a lower household indebtedness will see buyers performing even better on debt repayments. Devon Morrigan, SABC News, Johannesburg. Macro is lending a helping hand with big festive season savings that'll move you. Like the Totem 16-inch or 20-inch Mojo bikes for only 1099. Save 200 Rand. Or save 200 Rand on the Bounce King 10-foot trampoline. Now only 2499. And zip away on a Zingo X100 electric scooter for 1999. Save 300 Rand. Share in these and other big festive savings for home, for business, for life. Only at Macro. Big on life.